Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. This is your host, Adam Graham, from more or less the present day. And we are bringing you, in this YouTube video, a week of archive programs from the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Now, these were recorded several years ago, are being posted exactly as they were, Except I am cutting the opening for all but the first episode to exclude the theme music and as much front matter as I can. And then also cutting down the end to remove some of that contact information. Now any specific offers or deals offered on the podcast are not actually valid unless they are shown on our current website at greatdetectives.net. This video does contain chapters, so if you don't want to listen to all of the programs in the week, you can skip around the ones that you want to listen to just like the original listeners did. Now it's time for our archive programs. Welcome to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Grant. We're going to get started with another great week of old time radio. Uh, featuring uh, Alan Ladd in Box 13. And we're going to get to that in just a, a moment. I, I do want to uh, let you know that um, when, when I first recorded the first, uh, at least the first 16 episodes... Um, it was my expectation we were going to use Blogspot. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I decided to get um, my own hosting for the show. Um, and uh, so uh, all our show notes are going to be at greatdetectives.net. So please go there for comments. That will be uh, from from now on and forevermore where all of our show notes will be posted. also hope to post maybe some uh, Old time radio news as well as we get the chance. Uh, and if you got any comments, feel free to email me at box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, this way I give my wife the password and I can ask her if there's anything for me in box13. Well, I am not going to uh, have any actual sponsors on the show till the end of the year. Uh, because I think most people are going to want to know uh, what type of audience does this show have. And uh, we'll find that out and then be able to uh, make some reasonable uh, uh, judgments at that time. But I do want to let you know about services that I've found helpful and that I think you may find helpful as well. Uh, the decision to host uh, my show as opposed to having somebody else host it uh, was a quite monumental one. Uh, and the reason I was able to do it was because of my host, One and One. You know, I've learned the hard way that um, uh, budget hosting uh, can sometimes be uh, a situation where uh, it's proved that you get what you pay for. And uh, I have, uh, I've had a lot of pain uh, with many budget hosts. Uh, it may have cost uh, $2.99 a month or, uh, or $6.99 a month. Uh, but it has come with uh, some incredible uh, exasperation. Uh, one person I met through the show, uh, actually through the Dragnet show, was Andy. Andy uh, uh, does the editing uh, over there. And he actually came and he helped me out um, with a problem I was having where hackers had, uh, had actually uh, launched a security assault on my website. And he suggested a better host for me. He suggested one on one, and I took his suggestion. I've got to say, I've not regretted it. One on one 
Um, and 101 provides steady, reliable hosting at a reasonable price. Uh, and the reason I'm able to host my own podcast here is we, it is now providing unlimited transfer volume. This means we can have tens of thousands of people listening to this show, downloading each and every episode, and there's no limit. Uh, hosting plans are inc- are still incredibly reasonable. Uh, you can get a beginner uh, a beginner website with uh, with an included free domain for three ninety nine a month, which is just a small setup fee. Uh, and they have other plans as well to meet your needs uh, from no matter what the size of your business or website. Uh, you can learn more about one and one one by going to hosting.greatdetectives.net. That's hosting.greatdetectives.net. Um, go and try it out for yourself uh, and experience the difference at uh, one and one. Well, without any further ado, we're going to get into today's episode of Box 13, Extra Extra. We'll go ahead and listen and then come back. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. He leaned over the shining halo of her blonde hair reflected in the soft glow of the new moon. Oh, no, 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 not that. Holiday, my boy, why did you ever decide to write fiction for a living? You know, you could have gone into something interesting like being a truck driver. With the open road in front of you and a motorcycle cop in back. Hey, Susie, where have you been? Don't you remember, Mr. Holliday? I went down to Star Times' office. Oh. Oh, so you did. Tell me, what's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, what now, Mr. Holliday? What's new in Box 13? Yesterday, a man wanted to sell me a horse for $1,000 and a ranch to go around the horse for 25 times that much. The day before, my ad for adventure brought me a reply from a golf professional who simply wanted to drive golf balls off the tip of my nose. Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, was that Susie? I said that when a nice young man like you runs an ad, he should get a whole box full of answers. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. He should get bushel baskets full. Well, thanks again. The, the place should be loaded with letters. All right, all right. Now, what did I get? One postcard. And from a kid at that. A kid? You mean a child? Sure, uh-huh. Here, let me see it. A postcard from a youngster. It's probably a gay. Some small girl selling 10 cent packages of flower seeds for 50 cents. Sell 5,000 packages and she gets absolutely free a St. Bernard dog. (laughs) Well, let's see what really is on this postcard. Hmm. I wrote to you, care of box 13, because I thought you wanted it that way. I got to see you right away on a very important matter. I am still doing business at the old stand. Signed, Johnny Moran. Johnny Moran? Why, he's a little boy who sells newspapers on the corner. Hey, Susie, get Johnny Moran up here right away. Oh, I can't do that, Mr. Holliday. Why can't you do it? Because he's here already. Well, Mr. Holliday. Oh, <laughs> Johnny, how are you, my boy? Why didn't you just come up and see me instead of writing a postcard first? Well, I like to do things sort of business-like. Besides, it was fun to answer an ad for Adventure Wanted. 
Would you really do anything, Mr. Holliday? Sit down, Johnny, and tell me what your trouble is. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to see you alone. Sort of private-like. Oh, that uh, man-to-man stuff, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, how would you like to talk? Well, I thought maybe you'd come down to the corner with me. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. A drink? You interest me strangely, Johnny. Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, Susie, you'll excuse us, won't you? Well, I don't know. You better be careful, Mr. Holliday. Careful? I don't want Johnny teaching you bad habits. Johnny Moran is a very nice boy. Can't be more than 12, but he certainly seems to know his way around. Yes, Holiday, if you were ordering a small boy, this is just the model you would choose. But this drinking business... I'm worried about you, Mr. Holiday. You sure that lemon coke is enough? Lemon cokes are always enough for me, Johnny. Especially when I spike them with an ice cube. Say, how's your banana split? Well, this one's got a little too much chocolate. I like the last one better. Better finish it, my boy. You want to talk business, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you might have read about it in the newspapers. Of course, you could have missed it. It was way back on page five. What was on page five? Well, here. I got a clip into the story. Read it. Police announced they had recovered a portion of the jewelry stolen in last Tuesday's raid on Maury Jewelry Company. Held under suspicion of grand theft is John Moran. John Moran. Johnny, that's your father. Yes, and he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. I know he didn't. Just a second. A part of the loot was found in Moran's apartment. I don't care what they put in the newspapers, Mr. Holliday. He didn't do it. That's why I came to see you. Uh, what about your mother, Johnny? Oh, she died when I was a baby. Pop and I lived together. But he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. Only they won't believe me. Oh, you've been down to the police? Sure, I went there right away. I even offered them my 18 bucks for bail. You know what? What? The old D.A. just patted me on the head and told me to go home. Mm. Well, I bet you could go down and talk to that district attorney and make him let my father out. You can do anything. Well, not quite anything, Johnny. Yeah, but this would be easy for a guy like you. Besides, you're not afraid of anything. Not even a policeman. Well, that's very flattering, Johnny, but I don't know what I can do. Oh, you'll think of something, Mr. Holiday. You're a writer. You're smart. Oh, but listen, my boy, I... I bet you get my father out of jail in time for dinner. Okay, Holiday. The boy says you can get his father out of jail in time for dinner. But what day? The story in the paper makes it look like they caught John Moran cold. You don't find stolen jewelry in a man's apartment if he didn't do the stealing. But there's a small boy waiting. Waiting with all the faith in the world. So, Holiday, do something. The district attorney will see you now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, thanks. Holiday. Haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I know. I've been pretty busy. Huh, busy, huh? Well, then what brings a promising young author down to City Hall? Because he's a promising young author who made a promise. And I hope he didn't make a mistake. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? About a man named John Moran. You've got him locked up in your nice new jail. Yes. And from what we've got on him, he's going to stay there for a while. His son thinks Moran is innocent, Clark. Yeah. I feel sorry for that boy. He came down and talked to me, but... What could I do for him? You've got the goods on Moran, then? Absolutely. The police found some of the stolen stuff in his apartment. Well, what's Moran's story? A woman who works in the same building with Moran asked him to stop in at the jewelry store and pick up her watch. While he was there, this stick-up artist walked in and held up the place. And that makes Moran guilty? Don't be in a hurry. The stick-up artist used him as a shield when he beat it. Moran claims the man forced him to drive the getaway car out into the country. Well, that still doesn't make him guilty. I think you've got the wrong person. This is where Moran's story went wrong. He walked into police headquarters and told it, but it sounded too good to be true. They detained him while a detective went over and searched his apartment. Oh? The detective found part of the loot. Moran couldn't explain where it came from. Well, to our office, it looks like he pulled a clever gag. We think he's in with the holdup men. What about the woman, the one who sent Moran after the watch? Grace Willard? We don't have a thing on her. She's in the clear. I see. So, Holiday, you better forget about playing Don Quixote. 
day of fighting windmills is over. Go home. Forget about Johnny Moran. Sure, Holiday, just forget all about John Moran. Write Benita the story and take it out of the typewriter. But how are you going to write the dialogue for a man who has to tell a small boy that his father hasn't got a chance? And describe the look in that boy's eyes. I don't care what that old district attorney said. My father isn't a crook. And your father should have been able to explain the stolen jewelry they found at your place. I'll bet he could, too. They just wouldn't listen to him. Oh, now, Johnny, if your father's innocent, they'll let him go. So you won't help me either. But I'm trying, my boy. What else can I do? Oh, nothing, I guess. See you later, Mr. Holiday. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm kind of busy right now. I got to earn a lot of dough, I guess. Johnny. Because lawyers come pretty expensive, I heard. Oh, look, kid. You better go home, Mr. Holiday. I should have handled it personally in the first place. <laughs> boys have that knack, don't they? They can just vanish into thin air when they want to. You're quite a character, Holiday. Go home and write this on your typewriter. Write about the small boy who wanted you to get his father out of jail. And you didn't quite make the grade. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Johnny. I'm up at the place where we live. Yeah, Johnny. There's something funny going on. What are you talking about? I'm afraid to go into our place. There's a man in there. Do you know him? Uh-uh. He's going through the place, though. He's looking for something. Johnny, listen. Run outside, find a policeman. I'll be right over. I gotta get out of here. Johnny, do what I said. He just walked out the door. He saw me. Get over to Moran's place fast, Holiday. You've got no time for fooling. He's not outside. Maybe he's upstairs. Oh, Johnny! Johnny! Where could that boy have gone to? Grace Willard. The woman who sent Moran up to the watch. If she knows Moran, she knows his boy. Yes? Oh, Miss Willard? Yes. Well, I'm Dan Holliday. Would you know where little Johnny Moran is? Come in. Now, what's this about Johnny? Well, he phoned me a few minutes ago from his place. There was a man going through it. He saw Johnny making the call. Johnny's disappeared? Yes. You phoned the police? Do you think he's been hurt? Well, the police knew nothing about it. I don't know what happened to the boy. That's why I came over here. I figured that if you knew his father, you knew Johnny, you know. Poor Mr. Moran. I feel so badly about him. You know, if I hadn't asked him to get my watch, this never would have happened. But that doesn't make it your fault, Miss Willard. Oh, I feel terrible about it, just the same. And now... Johnny disappearing. He hasn't been here at all? No. Let me think of it. Oh, uh, by the way, I was just having some coffee. Would you care to join me? Grace Willard is a very nice person. Really worried about the boy. Perhaps she'll come back with an idea. Here's your coffee, Mr. Holliday. Now we'll talk. Well, thanks. Uh, did Johnny recognize the man? No, he didn't have time to say. Well, perhaps he found a policeman on the street. He might have gone back to the house. Well, maybe I ought to call back. Johnny's a cute little fellow. Johnny has a father who's in jail. Johnny's quite concerned about his father and would like to set him free. Grace Willard is stalling holiday, waiting for something. I don't know if Johnny will get his wish or not. You see, his father looks very guilty to the police. Holiday, you idiot. That coffee was doped. The oldest gag in the world and you swallowed it. You look sleepy, Mr. Holiday. Are you feeling all right? She looks like a reflection in one of those amusement park mirrors. She's, She's long and skinny. No, no, she's short. Short and fat. Holiday. Holiday, get up on your feet. How do you feel, Mr. Holiday? Are you all right? Anson. Get on your feet, I said. Walk, Holiday. Walk. Walk this thing off before it's too late. You look very tired, Mr. Holiday. Let me get you a pillow. Come on. Come on, Holiday. One. Pig How do you effort. feel, Mr. Holliday? I... I... I can't... can't make it. 
You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, take it easy, Holiday. Take it easy. Turn slowly now. Maybe your head still is connected to the top of your neck. That's better. Better. Hmm. What am I saying? Where am I? An alley. Oh, fine. Dan Holliday, author found lying in an alley. Between yesterday's newspapers and tomorrow's trash. What you need right this minute is a quick change, a fast bath, and a little chat with a district attorney. I've got a man going up to the Willard woman's place right this minute, Holiday. Thanks, Clark. This ties her up with the Moran case. Sure, or else why would she give me knockout drops and have me dumped in an alley? I'll bet anything she's disappeared. But why just knock you out? Why not dispose of you permanently? I don't know, unless she was trying to kill time. Enough time to get something done. Well, you can't do anything now. If she's disappeared, she won't stay lost for long. My men will bring her in. Uh, don't let her give him any coffee. She'll be out again. Uh, pardon me. District Attorney's Office, Clark speaking. Yes? Where? When? How is he? Thanks. I'll see you later, Clark. I want to go over and see Johnny Moran. I don't think you'll find him at home, Holiday. Why not? That was the hospital who just called. Johnny Moran was brought in a while ago, the victim of a hit-and-run driver. And on top of that phone call about Johnny Moran is another one. Grace Willard checked out of the Wharton Hotel an hour ago. So, Mr. Holliday, they got you out of the way long enough to get to little Johnny. A small boy in a hospital. Me with an aching head and an aching feeling that something is very, very wrong. I think this is it, room 809. Johnny? Call Mr. Holliday. How do you feel, kid? Kind of banged up. Yeah, I know. The nurse said you weren't to do too much talking. So just let me ask a couple of questions. It wasn't an accident, Mr. Holliday. He did it on purpose. You sure about that, Johnny? Yeah. I was walking down a side street. He had to swing way over to the wrong side to hit me. Johnny, did he look like the same man who was in your place? I didn't get a good look at him. He was bent down way behind the wheel. Well, could you give me just a hint... Was he tall, short, thin, fat? All I know is... Yes? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny passed out and won't be permitted to talk for a while. Well, that puts it up to you, Holiday. Come on, you're an author. You write hundreds of situations like this one. Think. boarding house where Johnny lives. Maybe the landlady saw the man. I certainly hope so. Johnny Moran? Yes, I saw him come home, but it was quite some time ago. Oh, did you see him leave? Yes, he went upstairs. I heard him on the telephone, then he came running down. Who was the man chasing him? Chasing him? There was no one chasing him. Are you sure of that? Well, of course I've been here all the time. Oh, poor little fella. Don't know what's going to happen to him, what with his father and all. This doesn't make sense. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing. You see, Johnny called me, told me there was a strange man in his place. The man saw him, he hung up the phone and disappeared. 
But I saw no man. Are you sure? Well, only Joe Coakley, but he's one of my rumors. That is, he was. Was? When did he move? Oh, today, just after Johnny left. Was he upstairs while Johnny was there? Why, oh, yes. Yes, he was. Uh, was he a friend of John Moran's? Oh, no, no, he never spoke to anyone. Stayed in his room all day and went out at night. Oh, one of those night flyers, huh? Uh, could I see the room he occupied? This is Coakley's room, but it's empty. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're on the wrong track. Track? Or are you? A stub from a dance hall ticket. I'd better talk to Johnny about this. Johnny, the man who came out of your room, was he about my height? Did he have grayish hair? Did he wear a brown suit? Yeah. Yeah, that's the man, Mr. Holiday. How come you never saw him before? He lived right across the hall from you. That guy? He only went out at night after I was in bed. Oh? Well, I'll see you later, Johnny. Hey, where are you going? Tonight I'm going dancing. <laughs> a very nice place, Holiday. Admission 60 cents, which includes an evening of dancing. And from the looks of the customers, they're trying to get their money's worth. Like to dance, fella? Uh, who, me? You ain't not twins, are you? No, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a very bad dancer. Oh, you let me be the judge of that. Come on, kid. You look good to me. Oh, wait a second. Say, isn't that Joe Coakley over there? Oh, you know Joe? Yeah, and uh, and the girl with him. That's his girlfriend, Grace Willard. Oh, thanks. I'll see you later. Hey, where you going? This is it, Holiday. Only what are you going to do? They're leaving, and if you stop to make a phone call, you'll lose them. And I wouldn't like to lose that man. He's the one who hits small boys with big automobiles. They're going into that apartment house. This begins to look like the final chapter. Now to make a fast telephone call to an old friend, then better to get to the payoff. Mm, this is a very nice door. You can hear quite distinctly through it. Well, Holiday, here's where you cease to be a wallflower and become the life of the party. Joe! Oh, it's Holiday. Put up your hands, fella. Sure. Sure. Close that door, Grace. Well, here we are. Aren't we? Can you find us, Joe? What are we going to do? You finish packing that junk, we'll figure out something. We, we can't let him stay alive. Finish the packing, I said. Too bad I didn't use poison in that coffee I gave him. Quiet. I uh, noticed you were packing. Going away someplace? What do you think? And get away from that bag, Holiday. Oh, that's the stuff that was stolen from the store, huh? None of your business. Oh, uh, going away together? You and Miss Willie? Maybe. Mm-hmm. You pull that go down and pick up my watch routine in a lot of cities, huh, Joe? Make him be quiet, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, who was the girl who worked with you before you met Grace? You know, the one who lived in Cleveland, or was it Chicago? I always forget. Come on, Joe, what happened Shut to up, her? you. What happened to her, Joe? Or the girl before. How do, you... How do you know there was another girl, Holiday? Well, Miss Willard, you don't think you're the only one, do you? You're crazy. Yeah? Ask him where he was last night. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace. He wasn't with you. Know where he was? How do you know he wasn't with me? The stub of a dance hall ticket I found in the other room. It calls for only... One admission. You shut up, I said. Just a minute, Joe. Were you down there last night? Were you dancing with that blonde again? Suppose I was. So what? You've got a lot of nerve. You have me set up this whole deal. Have me find John Moran to play sucker for us. Have me frame the business of picking up my watch. I time it out perfect for you. What do you do? You go dancing with a blonde. Grace, be quiet. This fellow's up to something. Me? Now, what would I be up to? What about that other girl he talked about? What happened to her, Joe? 
Why don't you tell her, Joe? Cut it out, will you? Did she plant stolen jewelry in a sucker's room like I did to Moran? Grace, listen. Yeah. I'm listening. Go on, explain. Uh, Holiday, where are you going? Just opening the door. You see, I'd like the district attorney to hear the rest of your explanation, too. chapter to a story I was afraid might have an unhappy ending. But Johnny Moran's father is free, the district attorney has Grace Willard, Joe Coakley and the stolen jewelry, and Johnny? Hmm. Johnny is out of the hospital. Mr. Holliday. Uh, uh, what did you say, Johnny? I said you might have been killed going up to the apartment like that. No, I was safe for the DA just outside the door. Gosh, and you figured it all out by yourself. No, you helped too when you telephoned me. And I hate to mention this, kid, but uh, did you bring the $18 with you? Sure I did. I pay off, you know. Here. Oh, uh, thanks, kid. I, I was just a little worried. I was going to pay before Mr. Holiday, but I didn't think you needed money that bad. I uh, needed it to put with this check. Uh, here. There was a $500 reward for recovering the jewelry, and it's going to a bank account for you. $500? Gee... Gosh, I guess I'm rich. Johnny, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you out and buy you a drink. How about an idiot's delight? Uh, a what? Idiot's delight. It's got a pint of ice cream, three bananas, some oranges, and seven flavors. Well, Johnny, I... I don't know, I... Oh, m- Mr. Holiday, I just heard that Johnny got out of the house. Ho- oh, there you are, Johnny. How do you feel? I feel swell, Susie. I just invited Mr. Holiday out to have a drink. He can't go out, Johnny. He's got some very important work to do. Well, gee whiz. Thanks a lot, Susie. Thanks? What are you thanking me for? You don't know it, but you've just saved me from a horrible fate. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Welcome back. Um... You know, in, as you listen to Alan Ladd here, uh, what what really comes out is how Alan Ladd may not have been um, as uh, Dan Holliday may not have been the the toughest detective on old time radio. Uh, there were quite a few that could have uh, that could have licked him. He may not have been the smartest, but Alan Ladd uh, simply may have been one of the finest actors. Uh, to take the role. Uh, I really like what he's got going on with Ladd. This, this kind of sense of questioning, uh, and almost, uh, uh, almost, uh, brooding. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of reminiscent when you hear Ladd doing it. It's kind of reminiscent, uh, of the inner monologue of Spider-Man in a way. Um, you listen to this. He's questioning himself, struggling with himself and, and what he ought to do. Um, and it really makes for great drama in the midst of this detective story. Uh, and I think it makes us feel like he's a real person and to connect with him. Um, and you usually don't see that in a lot of these detective shows. Uh, really, um, Al, Alan Ladd may have done it better than anybody up until Bob Bailey took the role of Johnny Dollar. So, From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham bringing you another uh, action-packed adventure of Pat Novak for Hire. Uh, before we get started, I want to just give you uh, contact information. You can email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net, uh, and check out the, our site, greatdetectives.net. We've got a lot of good information there. 
Um, before we get started with tonight's show, I do want to uh, let you know about Netflix. Uh, folks, in this economy, people are looking for ways to save on entertainment and also to get good quality and good value for their money. Uh, that's why I urge people to sign up with Netflix. Uh, with Netflix, you can get unlimited movies for a reasonable price based on your family's entertainment needs. And it's going to be cheaper than cable or a premium channel like HBO. And it's totally driven by you. You don't get to watch what the uh, TV networks decide uh, is going to be on the air. You get to pick uh, from over 90,000 movies and television shows. Plus, if you sign up, you get a two-week free trial. Uh, to go ahead and sign up for Netflix and also to help support the great detectives of old-time radio, visit netflix.greatdetectives.net. Now, before we get into t uh, tonight's episode of Pat Novak for Hire, I'm going to give just an honest advisory. If you you're, you get a little squeamish um, and of uh, good imagination, you may not want to listen to this. This uh, ends kind of uh, it's it's kind of harsh. So uh, just that little warning. But let's go ahead and get into uh, Pat Novak for hire. The Reuben Calloway pictures. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. You don't get in the blue book that way, but you don't embarrass your friends either. Because down in the waterfront in San Francisco, they don't separate the good and the bad. They let them run together. And before long, you got a caste system. You're either alive or dead. If you're on top, you keep fading the crowd and trying for sevens until you lose the dice. It's about the only way to play it, unless you like worms. I rent boats and do anything else that'll put a fast handle on a buck. But it doesn't always work out because down here all your luck is junior grade and trouble is trumps. I found that out Tuesday night. It was the first time I ever saw Reuben Calloway and the last time, too, if you like to keep a tidy record. It was about 7 o'clock and I'd just started back across the bay from Sausalito. You could still see Mount Tamalpais squatting on the Marin shore. Light brown near the top, but dark and black farther down, like a cupcake that's been in the oven a little too long. A low fog was beginning to squeeze in on the far side, so I kicked in the searchlight, and that's when I picked him up. He was struggling feebly with his face near the water, and he was almost bald, so that when the light hit him, he looked like a cantaloupe that somebody got tired of. I pulled alongside and started to haul him aboard. He brought most of the bay with him. Help me! Please help me. Yeah, well, we'd like to get a hold of you, will you? Come on. There. Sit down. No, here. Lean against the gunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is the water red or you've been shot a little? Do you have to know everything? No, it's your load. Carry it, mister. Yeah. Move your feet. i got to get us ashore. If you like it, go ahead. But don't hurry for me. Well, if you feel that way about it, pick another spot to die and go back in the bay where you'll have company. You've got to help me. I want you to... Get in touch with a girl named Alma Biggs. Yeah? You'll find her at the Empire Club out on Geary Street. My name's Reuben Calloway. Tell her about me. She'll pay you for it. What's she do, collect bodies? Just give her this key. It's for a locker down in the bus station. Now, look, Pop, you don't know me. Suppose I use the key. You can't spend it. You better take the money. All right. 
Just see, Alma, and tell her it didn't work out. It didn't work out for me at all. I guess that's right, huh? On the big things, you're 100%. I don't need a check. Oh. Here, set up. I told you I don't want you dying in here. Stop beefing, fella. You don't have all the bad luck. <laughs> They must have sent a fast chariot because when I leaned over, the guy was dead. And he was working hard at it, too. He was a skinny little guy, all bent up and twisted in the bottom of the boat like an old paper clip. It wouldn't do any good to straighten him out because he wasn't going to sleep easy. His eyes were open and rolling around at the sky as if he was on the make for a star. And the skin hung loose around his face so that when you touched it, it felt like an empty baked potato. I pushed him into a corner and started for Pier 19. When I got there, I hauled him on the dock and went down to call homicide. Must have been about 8.30 when I took a cab out to the Empire Club. It was a gambling joint out on Geary Street where they cut their whiskey and cards in different rooms. I asked the guy at the window if he knew Alma Biggs and he pointed her out by the roulette table. She was wearing a white satin evening gown. And as I walked up behind her... I noticed she moved in rhythm with a roulette wheel. It was interesting. If it had been a merry-go-round, they'd have pinched her. I squeezed in next to her at the table, and I was thinking of trying it again when she started to talk. It's a tight fit. Are you sure you like it? I'm not going to stay long. That's what Rudolph Hess said. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Gamblers, make your bets. Stake me, Alma. I can't afford you, darling. Well, go broke for Reuben Calloway, then. Four on the red. I ought to keep you for luck, darling. Will you comb your hair? I'll take the chips. They'd look bad on Calloway. Oh. It's too crowded here. Let's find a closet. All right. Did he look pretty? For a fish, he was all right. How are you? Pat Novak. I picked him up in the bay. He said to look you up and tell you it didn't work out. Hmm. That would please Turk. Yeah? Who's Turk? The reason it didn't work out. Is that all, Mr. Novak? Except for a key... It fits a bus station locker here. You keep it, Mr. Novak. It won't buy anything. Now, look, sweetheart, I picked up your boy and dried him out, but that's all. We were small friends at best, so the services stopped. You can come to a slow stop for $200. Let's take the key and pick up what's in that locker. I'll get it from you later. Yeah. I'll meet you in an hour. Where's a good place? Your apartment? Well, it's a place. I'll find it in the book. I hope you don't mind. No, the thin walls will save me. What's in the locker? What would it prove? Proves you got a small mouth, Angel. Unless you're going to kiss it, don't worry. 9.30, then? All right. I'll bring the 200 with me. Don't worry about the dough. Oh? Because I scooped your chips off the table. See you later. She stood there watching me as I walked over to the cashier's window. Oh, she gave you a nice warm feeling like a Bunsen burner in the middle of your back. And as she stood there in the center of the floor, smiling, you knew she could turn a glacier into a steam bath at 400 yards. A nice little mouse that made you want to go home and test all the old traps. Well, I cashed in her chips, and the boy at the window shoved out 200 rocks and a pained look as if he'd just handed over his right lung. I got a cab and rode down to the bus station at 7th and Market. There were a few people sitting at the counter and a couple of old men on the benches waiting for somebody to get up and leave the funny papers. I went over near the wall and opened up the locker. It was a long trip for a small package. It was a square manila envelope and there was an address up in the corner. Reuben Calloway, photographer. I squeezed the envelope and it felt like photographs, but I wasn't sure. I started to close the locker when I turned and then I tumbled for the first time. It's like getting a drop of rain on your hand before you ever look up at the sky. The two of them were standing over by the cigar counter watching me. A guy with a heavy overcoat and a little small guy about the size of a hangnail. It wouldn't do any good to sit down because I knew they'd stay until somebody condemned the building, so I walked past him out onto the street. There was a cab standing right in front. Cab, mister? Yeah. Swing up toward the St. Francis, will you? Yeah. Now, look, you're going to be tailed, so brush up on your alleys. If you like it that way... 
Hey, you were supposed to take a left there on mission. I got a license. Where's yours? I told you to double back over market. Look, get out and walk if you don't like it. I've been bought, mister. Oh, my two friends. That's right. You should have come first. I ought to part your hair. You got more chance with them. Here we are. Where are you going? You like alleys. That's what you're going to get. Yeah. Take it easy, fella. You're not going anywhere. You were nice while you lasted. Take it easy. You better walk up a wall. They'll block the alley. See? Crowded alley, huh? Yeah. Give me the envelope so we can all get out. Can Junior help you? Give me the envelope. There. Now let's see it. Yeah, it's still sealed. You all through? I don't know. I'll see. You like him, Joe? No. That's the way it is, mister. He don't like you. <coughs> I slid down like an old sock on a bony leg. I rolled over a couple of times and tried to stand up, but it wasn't easy. You might as well try to find a hair in a bowl of chopped suey. Well, it began to rain, and I figured it'd be easier to float out to the street, so I went to sleep. When I woke up, the rain hadn't helped the alley much. It's like washing your kid's face and finding out he was ugly to start with. The mud had washed up against the walls, and there was a thick, sour smell, and down the alley across the street there was a part of a sign sticking out that said eats. And that isn't what you felt like at all. I started groping around to get up and my hand hit the pictures. They were scattered all over like clothes in a boarding school. I picked them up and started for the street. On the way up in the cab, I got a chance to look at them and they didn't make sense. There were six of them and they were all just about the same. A bunch of mob scenes of that fire over in Oakland. I didn't have time to figure it out because the cab pulled up in front of the St. Francis and I went in to call Alma Biggs and tell her the party was off. Part of that alley must have come with me because when I walked into the lobby, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up a nunnery. I tried the number once, but nobody answered. I decided to wait 20 minutes and call again. That was a mistake because I just got in the booth and started to dial and somebody started rapping on the door with a nickel. It was Hellman from Homicide. Hello, Novak. Come on out. You can't get a date in that suit. What do you want, Hellman? Come on, out! Oh, you're a hard man to find. Well, you don't look in the right places. I'm a family man. Tell me about the dead guy. I don't know, Hellman. He died in my boat. That's all I know. He didn't say anything? Just sentimental stuff. His name's Reuben Calloway. Somebody threw him in the bay without instructions. I don't know a thing about him except he takes pictures. Yeah? I'll wipe off the drool. They're not your kind. Who are his friends? He's got new ones by now. I don't know, Hellman. How about that guy up in your couch? Huh? I just left your place. How about that guy on the couch? There's a gal up there, but that's all. Does she wear suspenders? Huh? Then take my word, it's a man. And you're going to tell me he's dead, Hellman? No, I'm not going to tell you he's dead, Novak. He may be a soft breather. When Hellman mentioned the stiff up at my place, I knew we were going to be in low gear the rest of the night because Hellman isn't an easy guy. He wouldn't give his wife an aspirin if she had concussion of the brain. He took me out the side door and we rode up to my apartment. The dead guy was lying on the couch with his arms across his chest as if he wanted somebody to give him a lily or a way out of this. The lamp was shining down in his face and the light was distorted, but when you stood over him, you could see his face with the color of pressed seaweed. If he had anything to be happy about, you couldn't tell. Because his mouth was open and hung over to one side like a loose change purse filled with old teeth. His clothes were rumpled and his shirt was open at his neck. You could see a chain around his neck and a silver medal in the dull light against his chest. It looked out of place and made you feel funny, like seeing a picture of a Madonna in a bowling alley. I watched him while Hellman made noise. He still looks like a man. Yeah? Who is he? George Leggett. What does that prove? Who his mother was? We're checking for a record. The gun, too. What gun? One was lying here on the floor. I want to know if it's the same gun that killed Reuben Calloway. Well, you'll need some prints. Anybody can buy a handkerchief. Where were you tonight? In an alley down near Mission Street. Do you like it down there? It's all right. You'd like it. 
I got shoved in and pushed around for these pictures. They don't look like the right kind of pictures. Well, I can't explain that, Hellman. Maybe they took the good ones. How do you fit in? Calloway gave me a key to a locker down on the bus station. It was for a girl named Alma Biggs. And the girl sent you down? That's right, with 200 bucks running money. If you want to know about Calloway, look up a guy named Turk. Turk what? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe he's only got one name. Maybe the other was Stinker. You got a police file? Look him up. The girl mentioned him. That's all I know. We'll look him up. But I'm not going to forget you. One guy's dead on Pier 19. Another up here in your apartment. You mixed up, Novak. There's a connection. I'll shop around till I strike it. You couldn't strike oil on a filling station. You got a double murder. Shop for a pair of people. I'll shop far enough to get you, big shot. Far enough to see you fry. Well, you got the lard for it, Hellman. <coughs> if you keep your mouth shut now, you can hold in the blood. Oh, Hellman talking. Yeah? Where'd you find out? <laughs> That'd make it easier. You sure the same gun killed them both? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in. Well? Huh? Oh. Wrong number, Novak. They didn't give Hellman a sense of humor. They gave him a loud laugh instead. When he walked out of my place, he was smiling like a funny man who's just exposed Santa Claus. I didn't feel very funny myself. I took another look at those pictures, and I was as mixed up as a guy with a Mexican divorce. They were just ordinary pictures of a fire in Oakland. What made them so important? I was sure that Gunsel had taken some pictures, but, well, were they any different than those? And why was Alma Biggs afraid to pick them up? And who was a guy named Turk? I was full of questions, but no answers, like some guy at a peace conference. If I went over it any more, I'd be counting my toes. So I got out of there and looked up Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's a good guy, and he was a smart one, too, until he decided the only way you can get a good trade in on hard luck is with a bottle of whiskey. I found him at Emilio's bar, patting Bill, the bartender, on the back with one hand and pouring jiggers of gin with the other. At the table down at Murray's in the place where Louis dwells. Jocko. Ba, ba, ba. Gentlemen, songsters off on a spree, doing from here to its end. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Shh, Patsy, I'm driving a Harvard man crazy. He's at the end of the bar. Well, stop drinking and listen to me. I've got to keep on drinking, Patsy, if I want to preserve any continuity in my life, because I don't drink to forget, but rather to remember. To remember all the pleasant events of my life. Uh, there were two of them, I think. All right, Jocko. The first was a girl I met many twilights ago, and the second was a summer night in St. Louis when a bartender felt crazed with the heat and set him up on the house. Will you stop it? I'm in trouble. Memory is a blessed toy, Patsy. But you have to be careful because it can be dangerous, like uh, giving a rifle to a small child for Christmas. It's true he can get some temporary pleasure out of it by shooting various neighbors, but... Sooner or later, he's going to kill the only rich relative in the family. Jocko, I'm tired. And memory is the same way. So you're entitled to collect the few good ones you have. You're allowed to straighten them out and put them in order. After all, an old pool ball gets racked now and then. You all through? Yes. I, I've run out of memories. Hellman thinks I killed two guys ten miles apart. Wasn't it difficult? The same murder gun. The whole thing is tied up with some pictures. In uh, color? A guy by the name of Reuben Calloway died in my boat. He gave me a key to a locker downtown. The pictures were there. Is that one of them? Yeah. Take a look. Oh, uh, if it's a group picture, they were a very unruly family. It's the Oakland Fire. Two Gunsels followed me and took some of the pictures. In the meantime, some guy got shot in my place. Everybody's after the pictures. Why? Have you seen the other pictures? No, I took an intermission. That's why you got to help. Now, you'll find Reuben Calloway's address in the phone booth. Get up there and go through his stuff, will you? It doesn't sound legal. Neither's a bum murder rap. Get up there and go through his pictures. Try to find anything that'll fit in with his set. Where are you going besides jail? I gotta find a gal named Alma Biggs. Oh, you'll have trouble with a name like that. She's probably changed it. The locker key was tabbed for her, but she hired me to run her errands. Is she pretty? Yes, if you like a fast track. Now, get up there, Jocko. Why can't I see her? Will you stop it, Jocko? Just get up there. Forget about her. She'd scare you to death. Yes. Well, at least I'd die hopeful. Good night, lover. Well, finding Alma Biggs was quite a job. 
I knew she was around, but I couldn't get to her. It was like trying to get a peanut shell out of a back tooth. I called the Empire Club, but they didn't know anything about her. I went through all the phone books and the city directories, and I didn't get anything but a sore thumb. Well, I didn't do any better with the hotels. I sat in lupos and called them all one by one, and by one o'clock I knew more desk clerks than a vice squad cop, but no Alma Biggs. Finally, I went out to the Empire Club and started talking to the cabbies. About 15 minutes later, one pulled up and remembered taking a girl in a satin evening gown up to an apartment on the hill. I called Hellman and rode up there to check the names. Alma Biggs had an apartment on the second floor. I knocked on the door and she didn't answer, so I tried it. The lights were out, so I closed the door and groped over to the desk. I should have noticed the draperies as I passed because they were full of people. <laughs> Wait a minute. All right, now. Wait a minute, Mr. Nilfax. Stop breaking things. Someday you may want to mend me. Uh, do you always sleep in the curtains? Do you always talk this long in the dark? Turn on the light. Yeah. I wanted to see who you were. George Leggett, maybe. Oh, do you know him? We're roommates. He died on my couch tonight. Anything serious or just humdrum death? He's satisfied. What do you know about him? Well, I never heard anybody say a bad thing about him. Of course, I never heard anybody mention him. Now, look, Angel, it's late. Who's George Leggett? Why do you care? Because homicide cares. They got Calloway and Leggett back to back, and they want my skin. Mm, it's a nice skin, darling. Where are the pictures? Unless you're a social worker, you're not going to like them here. Let me see. They're not all here. Yeah, I figured that. Where are the other pictures, Patsy? In some Ghanoff's album. Two of them jumped me down near Mission Street. Who are they? We never got that friendly. Well, there couldn't have been two of them. Well, maybe the little guy was just window dressing, but he gave the right answers. Patsy, I think you're a liar. You're nicer than homicide. I want those pictures. You do. Well, I'm going to take them away from you. Well, if I had them, that's a big enough gun to do it. Get the pictures, Patsy. It's a bad time for murder, Angel. Homicide's working this week. I haven't time, Patsy. I'll push you down like a blade of grass. Get the pictures. Now, look, sweetheart. I took a job for 200 bucks. It covers a tandem murder rap and a sapping down on Mission Street, but it won't cover big talk from you. Now, put the gun away or I'll bend you hard. Don't move up when you talk. You're around behind. Come on, give it to me. No. Up it, Patsy. Feels good. Let it go or take the pain. Drop it. You don't have to hang on. I'm not a barbell. Now, you're handy now. Who's Turk? Stop it. You're hurting my arm. There's a guy named Turk. I want to know who he is. You're late for that. Who is he? Go ahead, tear it off, and you'll die ignorant. Yeah. You sound blue, Novak. Oh, what do you want, Hellman? I want to give you a reason. We got the coroner's report on George Leggett. Yeah? He died in your apartment. The blood off your carpet looks good on these slides. All right, so the murderer sold me the rug. So what, Hellman? So we ran down George Leggett's record. A Detroit gunman who got out here six weeks ago. Yeah? He traveled for years with a guy named Turk Spaniel. Now, that's your boy. You better find him. We already have. Don't tell me he's up on the couch. He was born too soon for you. We check with the Detroit police. What'd they say? They know all about Turk Spaniel. He was killed nine years ago in West Detroit. But they found the guy that did it and sent him up to Lansing for life. Yeah? Yeah. He was a guy named Joe Biggs. Say hello to your girlfriend. Well, I didn't talk to the girl because I knew she'd close up faster than a Dublin meat market on Friday. I left her and went down to the Chronicle morgue to find out what I could about Turk Spaniel. Hellman had covered it. Spaniel talked too much, and Joe Biggs killed him and left him growing out of a ditch like an old weed. I didn't know where to turn now. With Turk gone, who was after those pictures besides Alma Biggs, and what did they prove? I knew the answer was there. Probably in plain sight, like a blimp on a football field, but I couldn't get near it. It was past two when I got back to my apartment and the phone was screaming for help. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. This is Jocko. What'd you find out? That Callaway was quite a photographer. Yeah? You should see some of the pictures. Ooh, I'm in love with you. All right, Jocko. Did you find anything? There's a check for a thousand dollars from Alma Bates. Yeah, what else? Some more pictures of the Oakland fire. One of them looks good. Yeah? It's just like the rest, except in the background, something is circled with a red pencil. That'll do it, Jocko. And there's a clipping here with another picture. I can't tell, but I think they match. What's it say? Well, it's all about... Jocko, what's the matter? Are you all right, Jocko? Jocko, you all right? He says to tell you no. 
After Jocko's call, I grabbed a cab and rode up to Calloway's apartment. When I got there, Jocko was sitting in the middle of the floor as sad as a steer on a sheep ranch. He hadn't seen who hit him, and the picture was gone, so was the clipping. I asked him if there were any negatives around. He said no. That meant that somebody was still on the prowl for those negatives. So I called Hellman and briefed him. He said he'd meet us at Reuben Calloway's studio in ten minutes. When we got there, it was dark, but I sensed Hellman in the back room. Turned out to be a couple of pans of acid, but Hellman was there going over the negatives. All this guy did was take pictures. Let me take a look, will you, Hellman? Can you spot the right one here, Jocko? Hold them up to the light. All right. Here are the fire pictures. Uh, how about this one? No, no, I had that one. Yeah, that's it. And, and this fellow back here is the one that was circled. Hold it up so I can see. Hello, Turk. You waited too long. Give me the picture, mister. All that gun will do is make noise, Spaniel. It won't make enough to keep a secret. Just hand me the picture. Somebody knows you're alive now. The picture's for laughs. It's your word against mine. And I'll be so far away I can't hear the argument. Let's have it. Don't give it to him, Novak. Yeah, I'll give it to him. You take it away, Hellman. Thanks, Novak. That alley taught you manners. Just stand over there. I want to remember the way you looked. Don't worry. I'll tell you about them, Turk. Huh? Keep backing into this gun. It's going to show around your breastbone. Well, guns are getting cheap. You better drop yours, Spaniel. Over there. Hmm. You look the same, Turk, or almost the same. You got this all wrong, Alma. Joe doesn't look the same. Nine years in the cooler and you lose your personality. Please, Alma, don't do anything crazy. After nine years, you lose almost everything. Joe's lost everything but me. Down on the floor, Spaniel. I want you on your knees. Please. Alma, you got it wrong. I got it all right, Turk, because Joe wouldn't lie to me. When he said he didn't kill you, I knew you were alive. Please, Alma. Down on the floor beside the table. Go easy, baby. You got a copper here. I can't hurt him, Novak. Turk Spaniel's legally dead. All you can do to a dead man is kick up the dust. Please, Alma. You're not seeing this right. I'm going to have a better chance than you. You couldn't see, Spaniel. You couldn't see your way back to help Joe out. You look good on your knees. Over by the table. Leave that asset alone, sweetheart. I'm going to help him see. With a whole pan full of it. I'm going to help you see, Spaniel. Please. Please, Alvin, you wouldn't do that. You got the short end of the bat. You better look at him, Jocko. Don't bother, unless you're a baby doctor. We may need you, lady. Not for this copper. Remember, Turk Spaniel's dead. Detroit says so. He looks live now. He can't be dead there and live here. I like your climate, but it's not that good. You can't see me, Turk. I'll bet you can hear me walk out of here. Goodbye, Turk. I'll send you a cane. Hellman managed to get most of the story out of Turk Spaniel. Reuben Calloway stumbled into the whole thing, and he didn't know what hit him. He went over to Oakland to take some pictures of the fire, and he got a picture of Spaniel in the crowd. Spaniel saw him and trailed him over to this side. He had to get the pictures because back in Detroit, he'd framed Joe Biggs with a riddled-up body and skipped out of the country. He'd been away until a few weeks ago, and... Now he was waiting for a boat out of San Francisco, so he had to stay dead. He sent George Leggett after the pictures, but Leggett figured it was a good way to double-cross him and stay in the clear, so he tipped off Alma Biggs, who'd come out here on a lead a few weeks before. Turk finally tumbled. With a local gunsel, he killed Calloway and left Leggett in my apartment where he trailed him. <laughs> it almost worked out, but he didn't get to that shop in time. Well, Hellman asked only one question. When I first met her, did I know that Alma Biggs was that hard? No. In that satin evening gown, I didn't think so. The 
The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the fifth of a new series, Fat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Fat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jack O'Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Etlin. In our cast were Yvonne Fady, Charles McGraw, Herb Butterfield, and Herb Ellis. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Now, a brief reminder. There is no mystery to this statement. Wherever they serve, at home or abroad, the men who wear the uniform of the United States are men of whom we can be proud. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. All of them serve our country and us with pride and honor. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Wow. Wow, if they if they actually showed uh, if if, it, if that was uh, shown in a movie, depending on how they played it, uh, that could earn uh, um, an R rating. Of course, there's some things you can do in movies in terms of cutting away, but that is brutal. And um, you know, one thing that I think is a hallmark of, of Pat Novak for hire is these um, is the psychotic uh, women of the show. Um, they're either psycho, psychotic or sociopaths, um, really in, in an amazingly large number. Uh, it gets a little better as the shows wear on, but wow, that, that, just, uh, 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 that just took the cake there, uh, what Alma, uh, Alma Biggs, that's just like, wow. Um, so definitely, definitely a hard-boiled adventure, so... From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you another exciting episode of Let George Do It. Um, Before we get into today's show, um, I wanted to let you know, I said something wasn't quite uh, accurate. I said there were about three episodes in the 1947 season, because I saw three episodes on the one of the sites I really use, uh, and it's great because... Uh, the author, somebody who's been, uh, was one of the people who founded Speederback, Jerry uh, Handages. Um, I reviewed his log, and there were three episodes showing. Um, the, however, uh, his, however, uh, the ones who really been doing the, the certification of the shows and figuring out what episodes out there, the Old Time Radio Researchers Group. They only had one episode, so I was trying to figure out if there was some lost episodes. However, there were two epi- those two episode titles listed for the 1947 season um, were actually um, are actually titled uh, from episodes later in the season. Now, generally, when you see that on an episode log, that means uh, one of two things. Uh, First, it can mean that the plot was the script was used twice, and that's completely believable um, because radio shows did that. Uh, we do commercials now; they reuse scripts. Um, so, or it can also be a situation where there's been some mislabeling, and a show has been uh, has been designated as. 1949, but it's real. 1947, but it's really a 5051 episode. Um, so that's what happened to that. So we are going to listen to the one and only surviving show of the 1947 season. Uh, it's called 42 on a Rope. Um, before we get started, though, I do want to ever so briefly um, let you know about the importance of finding the right web host for your website. Uh, you know, rely, when you put up a web, po- uh, a web page, the, the goal uh, is to be able to have it viewed by the world. Well, you can't do that if you don't have reliability, um, if you don't have the space to meet your needs and to be able to expand as much as your imagination will allow. 
Well, that's the great thing about one and one I ran into so many problems with other hosts. Um, but one and one is the first host I've had where I felt confident enough that I could upload the large files we use for these podcasts. Um, uh, in many cases, uh, we're looking at eight, seven, eight, nine megabytes uh, downloaded from our server to your computer. Uh, and they're the first host I found that I could trust to reliably do that uh, at a reasonable price. Uh, they have great hosting packages, uh, including some starting for under four dollars a month with a small setup fee, uh, with free with free domains included, with one, two, or even more. Uh, there are many great hosting packages to see whatever your needs are. So I encourage you to go to hosting.greatdetectives.net. Uh, but without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into this week's uh, episode. I'll let George do it. 42 on a rope. 7.30 p.m. this Saturday evening. The time now, 8 o'clock. The makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil invite you to Let George Do It. Adventures of George Valentine, brought to you on behalf of Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Tonight's adventure begins as George, feeling very safe after making a special trip downtown to pay the premium on his accident policy, walks briskly down an isolated street to where he has parked his car. Suddenly, from the open stairway of a building, a cascade of small round pellets bounces to the pavement, followed closely by a young woman in great haste. There is a collision, and George hits the sidewalk with the force of a blockbuster. You don't have an extra sacroilla yet, can you? Can you get up? I, I think so. Well, then, do you mind? Do I mind what? Getting up off the pavement. Well, if I'm in your way, couldn't I just slide over? You're lying on my pearls. Pearls? Oh, good. I thought those lumps were misplaced vertebrae. No. Oh. Hey, uh... Oh, thank you. Now, let me see. That makes 32, 33, 4... Yeah, here's a few in the gutter. Oh, good. Yes, 35... 36, 37. Hey, have you seen any teeth down there? They're mine. Oh, I'm sorry you fell down. 38, 39. Oh, here's one of my trouser cups. Thanks. 40. Oh, I see you, you little rascal. 41. 41. 41. Lots of 41s, aren't there? I've lost one for 42. I've lost one. Oh, good Lord, what'll I do now? They'll kill me for this. Oh, come now, please. Where is it? Where is it? There were 42 of them. What have you done with uh, it? Well, I, I'm afraid I've kicked it down that sewer drain. What? You kicked my pearl down the... Where? I don't see it. Oh, over there, see? Here, through the grating. Oh, were well, you lucky? Landed right in that Sunday cup. Oh, I see it. Oh, yes, there it is. Oh, thank heaven. But how do we get it out of there? Well, it's a very delicate engineering problem. I need a long stick and, uh, and a chewing gum if you're through with it. Here. Thanks. Now, let's see. Oh, that's lucky. Here's a stick. Let's point to it. Uh-huh. Can you reach it? Uh, no. No, not long enough. You know, that's quite a drop down there. Oh, good Lord, if anything happens to that pearl. Well, I hate to do this, but... Are you going down there? Uh, huh? Here, hold my coat, will you, lady? All right. There's a ladder in here. Don't fall down and hurt the pearl. Oh, thanks a lot. I'll be careful. Uh-huh, got it. Oh, give it to me, quickly. All right. Catch. Oh, oh nice one. Thanks. Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing Thanks with that ladder? Thanks a lot, Hanson. You've been very helpful. Hey, what is this? Put that ladder back. Uh, the least we can do is leave things like we find them. Hey, come back here, you. What's the matter with Don't you? Don't worry, lover. A heavy rain ought to put you right up to the top. Sorry I just can't stand saying goodbye or answering questions. Well, I'll be... A... Hey! Help! <laughs> Something for you, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, this looks like the right place. Are you Mr. Zagetti? To be precise, Bela Zagetti. 
I am he. Oh, Mr. Zaghetti, I can see by the layout here you're a jeweler. Now, I wonder if... To be uh... precise, I am not a jeweler. I manufacture artificial gems. Uh, To put it this way, I do my small part to brighten the lives of those who otherwise are not very bright. Is this exact? Yeah, probably. Well, what I want to know is, have you recently brightened the life of a young lady with a string of artificial pearls? To be precise, a blonde, Miss Dale Quidden. Yeah, that's right. I saw her coming out of this building, and I thought that... A uh... beautiful job. Smooth and pink and utterly perfect. Yes, she was. To correct myself, I refer to the string of matched imitation pearls. Ah. (laughs) Pink ones. Forty-two on a rope. She was pretty particular about the specifications. Oh, yes. They were a duplication of... But if I may ask you a question... Sure, of course. Uh, To put the question in this way, why do you ask this question? Well, I, uh, I admired her set. I was interested in buying it, but she wouldn't sell. I wondered if you could arrange for me to have a duplicate set. Oh, it would take many months. How much would it cost? It, to be precise, three hundred dollars. <laughs> well, that's a little too precise. She told me you made hers for two hundred. But no, it was the same. The price is no different. Oh well, maybe I misunderstood. But I'd like to check. Not that I distrust you. But no, you. there is no doubt. I am an honorable man. Please verify this. Yeah, I'll do that if you'd like to give me her address. But of course, I have a record of my sales. You will find out. That's all I want, Mr. Zaghetti. I just want to find out. Well, after all, George, anybody who'd go down into a sewer pipe after a blonde deserves everything... Oh, now listen, Brooksy, I didn't follow her into the sewer. I was doing my good deed for the day, and she ran off with my coat and wallet. Hmm... What were you looking for, a merit badge? Oh, now, Brooksy, listen. Well, it's a nice way to meet a girl, I must say. Sprawls senseless in the gutter. And all she has to do is blink those big brown eyes and... Blue eyes. Blue eyes. And you go scurrying down the drain pipe like a... Like a... Rat. Rat. Thank you. And then because you're caught in your own trap... Well, that'll teach me to keep my trap shut. You come cringing back to me like a... Like a... puppy. Puppy. And you expect me to feel sorry for you. So she jilted you. Good for her. What were you trying to prove anyway? Well, I guess I was just trying to prove I was willing to start at the bottom and work up. Brooksy. What? You're not mad. Oh, George, of course not. But I hate to see a woman make a fool out of a man like you. Another woman, that is. Well, don't you worry. I'm going to prove to her I'm nobody's fool. I know you're not, darling. Yet. But I'm working on it. Hey, wait a minute. Here we are. Yeah, you're right. There's the number. Seven, seven, oh, oh. Oh, oh, is right. Sure you want me to come along? Unless you're afraid of the competition. What? Oh, aren't you smug. Lead on, Macduff. Yeah, here's a name on the box. Miss Dale Quillen. I'd like to give her a piece of my mind. Now, Brooksy, let me do the talking to you. Yeah? Miss Dale Quillen? You're kidding? I mean, I mean, she means, is Dale Quillen at home? You're kidding? Well... Is he kidding? Well, someone is. Hey, did you get a look at that house? What? Through that solid wall of muscle? Well, the place is a wreck. Furniture turned over, paper scattered on the floor. Poor housekeeper as well as a crook. What are you going to do? What is this, a gag? Um, we've decided to wait. What are you, a mad character or something? Blow. Oh, come off it now, handsome. Anybody can see you've got a heart as big as all outdoors. Yeah? Then stay outdoors. Hey, character, get your foot out of the door, I'll chop it off. You know, you could be a lot of company for us while we're waiting. Yes, sir. A lot of company. Yeah? Give me your address and I'll drop you a postcard. If you want it any clearer, I'll step outside. Come on, I dare you. Take it easy, I warned you, Joker. Let him go, Nobin. You're too quick with the fish. We're all <sighs> friends now. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great little equalizer you got there. It is small, but persuasive. Bring him in, Nobin. I think we have interest in common. Come on, you. In one piece, Nobin. Perhaps you can take him apart later. Inside, kidder. Easy. Yes, Nobin is just a big, playful child. He loves to take things apart. But he has never quite learned how to put them together again. Now, shall we talk? We'll 
return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, let's go from assault and battery to just plain battery. For thousands of Western motorists, October means a lot of weekend driving, like football games and hunting trips. But for the battery in your car, October means extra work and power drainage because of the colder weather and lots of stop-and-go driving. So let me give you a two-way economy tip. First, depend on the men at your standard station or independent Chevron gas station for periodic battery checkups. They have all the equipment and know-how for keeping up your battery's maximum power and for giving it longer life. Second, when you fill up your tank, ask for Chevron Supreme gasoline. Tailor-made for each different climate and altitude zone, high-octane Chevron Supreme assures instant starts, eliminates grinding on the starter, and drain on the battery. So for definite battery economy in colder weather, just remember regular battery checkups at any Chevron gas station or standard station and Chevron Supreme gasoline. And now back to the second part of 42 on a Rope, tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well... It seems that George's curiosity following his strange encounter with a mysterious girl and a broken string of pearls has landed him in a tight spot. For minutes now, Baptiste and Nubin have been questioning George and Claire until... I've told you everything I know. This girl, this stale quellant, made me look silly. So I came here for an explanation. Now I feel even sillier. You have come here looking for something. So have we. Naturally, we are all sincere people. Perhaps we can help one another, uh, Monsieur... Uh... Valentine. George Valentine. And that depends on what we're looking for. Naturally. Pink pearls, no? Forty-two on a rope, is it not? We're looking for Dale Quillen, remember? Naturally. Because when we find Miss Quillen, Baptiste Lavon also finds his pearls, n'est-ce pas? I wouldn't know. Who's Baptiste Lavon? Oh, my apology. It is I. Oh, I see. Well, what makes a string of phony oyster fruit so important anyway? Phony? <laughs> I do not know this phony. Ringers, fakes, dupes. Artificial, counterfeit, paste. Ah, the replicas. You refer to this fraudulent string, huh? Uh huh. Yeah, that's it. Where'd you get them? Uh, they were left by Miss Quillen at the check room of the Union Station. She sent me the claim check. At the same time, no doubt, boarding a train for some distant city. Why would she do that? Because they are worthless. Good imitations, no more. Value, perhaps $300. As you say, phony. You're trying to say she pulled a switch on you? Ran off with the real pearls, your pearls, and left you the ringers? That is correct. As always, Baptiste Lavon was sincere. I trusted her with 42 exquisite gems. Gems collected by no other than Louis XIV to give to his Antoinette. Tell me, Lavon, where did you get hold of Marie Antoinette's choker? Ah, spoils of war, Monsieur Valentine. As an officer of the Vichy government in France... My job was to appraise and catalogue war prizes for the victorious Nazis. Naturally, the sincerity and integrity of Baptiste Lavon were above approach. Naturally. So you held out the match picks. Naturally. Oh, when the fortunes of war were reversed, Baptiste Lavon reversed too. Uh, Miss Quillen came to Paris with an entertainment unit, and uh, we became uh, friends. And she smuggled them into the States for you. Uh, That is correct. That'll teach you not to be so sincere. Are you kidding? Well, hello. Now, uh, you are friends of Miss Quillen. You see my predicament. Uh, I must know where she is. You will tell me? I've told you. I don't even know the girl. Your mode of entry contradicts you. You are a confederate. We are not quite fools here. Yeah, we ain't no dopes, you know. You do not help nothing. Well, <clears throat> mm, they are stubborn. Now you may take the man apart. The girl adores him. She will weaken first. You may proceed. Yeah. I'll loosen him up first with my belt. Then I'll get technical. No, don't. He doesn't know anything. Let go of my arm, lady. Stop it. Let him alone, you fool. Can't you see he doesn't know anything? You won't let go, Baptiste. Yeah, I would advise you to do as nothing said. Claire, better sit this one out, honey. I won't let them. I... Who's that? Uh, I don't know. It seems to be a messenger of some sort with a package. A package? I will not insult your intelligence by warning you to keep quiet. Answer it, Nubbin. Yeah. I've got a package here addressed to, uh, Handsome. <laughs> Handsome, that's all the name it's got. That's me. 
I'm handsome. You? Are you sure? You're kidding? Give me the package. Well, can you uh, identify yourself? Sure. Take a good look at me. Now, wouldn't you say I was handsome? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. You got pretty eyes, too. Okay, give me the package and dust. <laughs> handsome, is This is surely not nubbin, nor is it Baptiste Lavon. Handsome, then, is Monsieur Valentin. Oh, no, not me. No, it's... Oh, yes, Monsieur Valentin. I will open the package for you. Sacre bleu. They're not here. It's nothing but a map. Yes, but a large map of the city with four small crosses marked on it. And these words, X marks the spot. But there are four X's. Yeah. One at High and 23rd. And one at Elm and Valley. And 14th and Underhill. And Cast and Granite. Four spots marked with X. What does this mean, Monsieur Valentine? Well, how should I know? Oh, go ahead, handsome. Tell them. They'll find out anyway. What? What are you... Oh, yeah, okay. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? She planted the 42 real pearls in different places. So even if you found one hideout, she'd still have three quarters of them hidden away at other places. Excellent. You know these hiding places? Naturally. Excellent. We will all go hunting. Nubbin, the young lady, you and I, and the gun. Please do not forget the gun. Well, here's the first stop, Costa and Granite. Where am I going to park? Pull up to the curb, Nubbin. Let us out. And drive around the block and pick us up here. Okay. Now, where? Where is it? Quickly. I cannot control myself. Well, you see that big office building there? Yes, yes. You see that window up there with the jeweler's sign? Well, I, I don't see it. Higher. Look higher. No, no. Where is it? No, it's higher yet. That's higher. No. Oh. Come on, Brooksy, run for it. Into that theater. Oh, George, we haven't been to a movie in ages. Oh, it's a cartoon. Good, I could stand a laugh. We didn't come in here for laughs, Brooksy. Do you think Levon saw where we went? I don't know. Pretty dark in here. You see? Oh, little. <laughs> Crowded. Maybe we'd better take singles. You leave me alone and I'll scream the place down. Okay, okay. Hey, that looks like two in the middle there. Good. Excuse us, will you? Pardon me. I beg your pardon. Oh, this is fine. We can hold hands. Oh, George, are you all right? I think so. Shh! Oh, did you see that? That was very funny. The monster was run over by a steamroad. I know just how he felt. Shh! What's it all about, George? What did those four X's on the map really mean? I don't know, but I'm working on it. You think we're safe in here? Well, there are four X's and we're right in the middle. Wait a minute. Shh! Quiet, I please. got it, Claire. That's it, the four X's and us in the middle. Shh, quiet. What, you two? No, look, George. There's LeBon coming down the aisle. Yeah, Nubbin's coming down the other aisle. Oh, I don't think they've seen us. Let's get out of here. Oh, George. Oh, gosh, now I'll never know how the mouse got out of the cement mixer. Anybody following us now, George? No, I think we've shaken him. Driver? Yes, sir? Got a map of the city? Yeah, hey, you are. Good, thanks. Say, pull over to the curb a minute, will you? Sure. What is it, George? I only hope LeVon doesn't figure it out as fast as I did. Hey, you got a pencil, Brixie? Uh, yeah, an eyebrow pencil. Good, thanks. Hey, now look. You remember the four intersections where the X's were? Yes. Now, I fold the paper here yeah. and draw a straight line from this X to this X. Fold it again and draw another from here to here. And you get a big X. Yeah, Brooksy. X marks the spot intersecting at DeLong and King Avenue. And that's where we'll find Miss Dale Quillen. You, you made it. Hello. And you did mean me. Of course, who else? 
I don't believe we've met before. I'm Claire Brooks, George's fiance. Uh, secretary. Well, it's practically the same thing. Looking at you, I guess it would be. How'd you know I was in your house? And how'd you know I'd get your message? I knew Baptiste and Nubbin were inside. I was watching from the vacant house across the street. I saw them take you in and knew they'd make it tough for you. What made you think I'd catch that X marks the spot routine? Well, you'd gotten that far with a lot less to go on. Also, I found your business card in your wallet. You're George Valentine, aren't you? Well, perhaps I should introduce you two. I figured you'd know the score because you're a professional troubleshooter. And bother have I got trouble. Well, if you can be of any Now, help. wait a minute. Remember the sewer, George. Oh, I'm awfully sorry about that. I was panicky. It, it won't happen again. Darn white of you. Come on, let's get away from here. First of all, suppose you tell us what you did with Marie Antoinette's necklace. After you. I, I haven't got it. I don't know where it is. Oh, well, that helps a lot. Take off, driver. Any of it here. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this. All we know is that you smuggled the pearls into the States. Now you tell us you don't know where they are. Take it from there. I know I had them. Levon concealed the pearls in a bottle of wine. I saw him do it. They were stuck to the bottom of the bottle with wax so they wouldn't rattle. Then he filled the bottle and sealed the top. I paid customs duty on the wine and got them through. Very smooth. Go on. Well, when I, when I got here, the seal was still unbroken, but... Well, you won't believe this, but when I opened the bottle, the pearls were gone. Somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, somebody had made a switch. You're telling me the pearls were hijacked from you? It's true, I swear it. But do you think Yvonne would believe that? He'd say I double-crossed him. Men are so skeptical. Do you believe me? Well... Say you do. Say you'll help me. All right, I do, and I'll help you. Oh, swell. Now, all we've got to do is find the person who stole the pearls from the girl who smuggled them in for the boy who stole them in the first place. <laughs> It's okay, Dale. This is my office. You'll be safe here. Yes, I'll see to that. Come on in, Claire. And shut the door. Better lock it. Should I swallow the key? Why did we have to stop at the library? Why did you have to take out a book at a time like this? Well, I'll tell you. And listen carefully. Levon's desperate. We've got to have some answers ready for him before he catches up with us. Well, I have a feeling he's close by. You don't know him like I do. He's closing in on me. I know he is. Look, Dale, look. Keep calm. He's not in the filing cabinet or under the desk. Hey, Brooksy, open the closet door and show Dale he's not in there pointing a gun at her head. Okay. I have a surprise for you. He is. Huh? Keep your hands away from that desk, Mr. Valentine. Back up, please, both of you. Miss Quinlan, remain where you are. Oh, no. No, I knew it. I knew it. Face the wall, both of you. Your hands high. Higher. Nubbin? Yeah, Baptiste? Keep them covered. If either one makes a move to interfere, squeeze the trigger twice. I'll do that thing. And that's no gag, Joker. And now, we come to you, Sherry, at long last, eh? Baptiste, listen, you've got to listen. You've got to give me a break. You made a fool of Baptiste Lavon once. For that alone, I hate you. Should you do it twice, I would hate myself. No, Sherry, your luck has run out. I didn't double-cross you, Baptiste. I swear I didn't. No? What do you call these? Pearls? You rotten little cheat. Oh, listen, I had them made, but give me a chance. I can explain. No, Sherry, they're phonies. Phony like yourself. That is the pearls. They were, they were gone when I opened the bottle. Somebody took them. You've got to believe me. You carry the light to the end, eh, Sherry? <laughs> Your last chance, my darling. Where are the pearls? I don't know. Don't move. Stay just as you are. I want to remember you like this forever. Bonsoir, Sherry. Come on. Quiet, Joker. I know where the pearls I are. I said quiet. Wait. What was that, Monsieur Valentine? Call off your dog, Levon. I'm ready to talk. Don't listen, Baptiste. He's a kidder. You can talk, Monsieur Valentine, from where you are. All right. Your story about Marie Antoinette's necklace got me interested in famous jewels. I've been to the library and picked up a book. That's it on my desk there, the red one. Now go on, open it. To the page I have marked. If this Wait, is nothing. Okay. A book, yes. Jewels of history. Go on, read it. Read what it says. I am reading. What is it, George? It's Dale's life insurance, Claire. Uh-huh. I have read it. Well? Well, I guess you win, Valentine. Can we put our hands down now, Levon? <sighs> of course. Let them alone, Nubbin. You have very nearly made a tragic mistake. I thank you, Monsieur Valentine. Baptiste Lavon thanks you. I don't get this, Baptiste. Come, Nubbin. 
We warn out our welcome. Monsieur Valentine, we will trouble you no more. You will never see us again. Bonsoir, chérie. Now I will remember you always as you were in Paris. Oh, it was a miracle, that's all it was, just a miracle. What did you do to him, George? What was in that book? Read it, Claire, out loud. Oh, yes. Cleopatra's Pearl. Cleopatra, to impress Mark Antony, once dissolved a pearl in vinegar and drank it to his health. Dissolved Now, wait a minute. Listen. Go ahead, Claire. Pearls which consist of carbonate of lime are extremely soluble in weak acids. They will dissolve in vinegar containing 6% or more of acetic acid or in wine which is turned sour. It was the wine that did it. The wine in the bottle. According to the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry and Soils, pearls consist of 91 and 7 tenths percent. Never mind the rest, Claire. That's enough. Well, how do you feel now, Dale? Oh, completely dazed. Lavon didn't have an argument in the world. He knew he planted the pearls in that wine bottle himself. He had nobody to blame but himself. I can't believe it. You saved my life and I... Oh, George. Now what? Now I have to go to jail. Well, it's going to be kind of hard to hold you there. Why? Well, technically, since there weren't any pearls in the bottle when you brought it through the customs station, you actually didn't smuggle anything in, even though you meant to. Levon filched the pearls from the Nazis, but I doubt if any of them will turn up to claim them. No, it was all a wild goose chase for something that simply didn't exist. Well, I'm going to confess my part of it and take what's coming to me. But first, George. Yeah? May I kiss you? <clears throat> he saved my life, Miss Brooks. May I? Where I'm going, it'll be a long time between kisses. Well, things aren't much better around here. But... Oh, all right, go ahead. Honestly, I think I must be going loony. Goodbye, George. Uh, Dale. <laughs> Just a minute. Yes? Be a nice girl and hand it over. What? Oh, come on, Dale. You certainly haven't forgotten why I got into this in the first place. And if you think I'm going to let you walk out of that door with my wallet, you're loony. <laughs> Next week, when you tune our way for The Joke Was on the Killer, another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear George saying... Some joke, I'd say. Brooksy, see what's happened to Mrs. Ralston, will you? Well, sure, George. Glenn, he made me go through with this farce and shoot those blanks. Well, he's not going to do anything like that to you again, Agnes. Wait a minute. Listen, everybody. This man is dead. We've had enough of this vicious nonsense. You're part of this, too. This act, Valentine. Now I know it. And you, get up. Oh, leave him alone. Come and help me with Mrs. Ralston, George. Now, stop this, all of you. What Just do you what do I have to do to make myself clear? This started out as a joke, but it's no longer funny. This man is completely, hopelessly dead. <laughs> Clinic care, hospital care, a visiting nurse in your home. They are made possible by funds from Community Chest. Thousands of persons, old and young, benefit each year from health services of Community Chest. So give generously this October for your community's health and welfare. Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West invite you to be with us again next week for The Joke Was on the Killer, another adventure of George Valentine, brought to you by the makers of Chevron Supreme Gasoline and RPM Compounded Motor Oil. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by Doug Hayes and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were George Sorrell, Jim Nusser, Betty Moran, Jack Crucian, Victor Rodman, and Dick Ryan. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. 
this episode, uh, in so many ways, I, I am not surprised this this survived. I was disappointed uh, when I found that the jokes on the killer, the next uh, the next episode, did not survive, nor was it repeated. I was like, darn. That sounded like such a great episode, um, but and it's kind of an interesting feature. It's it's not something that I hear on every show, uh, where they will go ahead and tease you with next week's episode. But unfortunately, what exactly it's about will remain a mystery unless somebody's got it out there. If you do, please contact the appropriate uh, old time radio authorities. There were so many uh, cultural things in here. The one thing that I found kind of neat was when they were in the theater, she was talking about, I'll never know uh, how the mouse got out. Now, that's not really something that we would say today, because we've got so many ways of viewing um, of viewing old movies and viewing old cartoons, TV shows, um, that we never that we expect we'll always be able to find it on reruns. Of course, it was not that case in the 1940s, but that was kind of for a little bit of a comical effect. Uh, one thing that you'll notice was not in this episode was Sonny. Sonny, of course, uh, at the start of the series, the um, uh, the sidekick to, uh, uh, to uh, George Valentine, uh, really, um, as the series progressed, move to a lesser and lesser role in the series. So at this point, I uh, was not um, uh, was not even included in this episode. I I think that the that the the whole episode, the solution, I had a hint about the wine, but I was genuine. I I thought that uh, it was just some incredible storytelling here. So my hats off to the writers. Uh, it was a great episode. I look forward to next week. Um, you know, it is sad that so many of these episodes are missing, though. Basically, with this episode, we have we finished every single episode of Let George Do It that was available uh, prior to Mark that was done prior to April fifth of nineteen forty eight. Um, and of those first seventy six episodes, only four are in existence. That's part of the big reason. Um, when you add up the stats for the show, that there are actually more missing episodes than there are episodes in the collection. The good news is that once you get to uh, the 1948 episodes, uh, you've got a lot of consistency with only a few missing episodes all the way up till 1952. So, All right, we're going to get into Sherlock Holmes today. Uh, and this one is actually one that comes out of the Holmes canon. Um, before we go ahead and get started here, um, I actually found out something about our current Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Um, the way I'd read off uh, the otrsite.com episode logs, he had been listed as Luis Hector, L-U-I-S. Well, and I, I thought that this was some unheralded uh, moment in Hispanic acting, um, the first Hispanic Sherlock Holmes uh, back in the 1930s, um, but that turned out not to be the case because it was actually Louis Hector, L-O-U-I-S. Um, so he was a, actually a longtime Broadway uh, Broadway player from 1922 to 57. Uh, we know he was born in 1883, but we have no record, uh, wasn't able to find on IMDb, uh, as to when he actually died. Uh, I did, however, note that he did guest star on uh, Tales of Tomorrow, a 50s uh, science fiction show, um, and he, he played on an episode where they discovered a device that would allow people to live indefinitely. So maybe that wasn't fiction, um, but he was just the main beneficiary. So if you're out there, Mr. Hector, happy 126th birthday. Um, but we're going to get into today's episode. This one is actually uh, based on the Sherlock Holmes canon. Um, this one's the uh, Devil's Foot. 
uh, before we do get started, uh, I want to let you know about Netflix. Netflix has a great assortment of uh, detective shows, including several uh, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, as of this recording, um, in the first part of October is when we're recording this, um, was able to actually watch two Holmes movies right off uh, Netflix without leaving the house um, right from the computer with inst instant watch. Uh, they've got more than uh, 10,000 different films that way, in old releases, new releases. Uh, but plus, you can get an unlimited amount of movies through the mail uh, at a reasonable price. Uh, I encourage people to try Netflix for themselves. You can try it out for two weeks free. Uh, if you're interested in signing up for a trial, seeing if Netflix will work for you as a great budget option in this tight economy, go to netflix.greatdetectives.net. That's netflix.greatdetectives.net. Uh, you got any comments on the show, feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, and as always, we encourage you to cast a vote for the show over at podcastalley.com. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get into uh, today's episode, The Devil's Foot. I, I suppose I am. Matter of fact, the adventure I'm going to relate was one of the most gruesome experiences I ever hoped to encounter. I never think of it as I can help. Or oh, perhaps I'd better not tell it after all. Brings up memories that I... Oh, I'll come, Dr. Watson. You're not going back on it now. The Cornish Horror, or The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. That was the name, wasn't it? Yes. The devil's foot. The very word still makes my spine tingle with horror. Oh, well, I'll get on with it. Good. It was the spring of the year 1897. Holmes' iron constitution had shown some signs of giving way due to a particularly arduous and nerve-wracking winter. In March of that year, Dr. Moore Aver of Harley Street gave positive injunctions that Holmes get out into the country with protracted rest. Holmes emerged first, but I finally persuaded him. Well, the third week in March found us settled in a small cottage near Paul Bay, the third of extremity of the Cornish Peninsula. Isn't that rather a bleak country for a convalescent, Dr. Watson? Bleak is putting it mildly. <laughs> Never known such grim surroundings. You must seem to keep Holmes admirably. Just his natural perverseness, I suppose. Oh, I dare say, I dare say. Our little whitewashed house stood on a grassy headland. From its windows, we looked down upon the whole sinister semicircle of Mount Bay, and that old death trap with its fringe of black cliffs and surge swept reefs. On the land side, our view was as somber as on the sea, a country of rolling moors, lonely and dun-colored. In every direction, there were traces of some vanished race which had left at its sole record strange monuments of stone. Holmes spent most of his time puttering round about these weird roads. Well, everything was going along peacefully until one morning, our simple and healthy routine was violently interrupted, and we were precipitated into the midst of a series of gruesome and nerve-shattering events. <laughs> Quite a surf this morning, eh, Watson? You can see the spray flung up against our windows, and we're a good hundred feet above sea level. I don't think I shall venture out today. Mm, bad weather. The old boy is certainly lashing himself into a fine frenzy. Uh, what, what do you mean, the old boy? The devil, Watson. The devil himself. What are you raving about? Didn't I tell you that the natives hereabouts refer to that seething death trap down there as the devil's cauldron? They think the old gentleman himself lives there. Dear me, uh, how unsettling. Yes, yes, a very interesting superstition. You know, Watson, that this locality is supposed to have been the last resort of devil worship in England. Many scientists believe that those huge prehistoric monuments of stone were part of a temple given over to the Prince of Darkness. The possible. I don't know. As logical as most of the theories have endeavored to explain their existence. The superstition goes on to say that when the devil was finally driven from his temple, he took refuge in the bay down there. Yes, yes, they claim that on stormy nights you can hear his hoofbeats as he races up and down the rock. Hey, Holmes, what are you trying to do? Give me a case of nerves. No, what's this? What's this? Someone running up our path. 
It's still flapping about like a giant's back. Why, it's, it's that Tegenis fellow. The one who boards with the vicar. What about Tegenis, eh? You wonder what's happened? Face is white as teeth. Open the door, Watson. Open the door. Mr. Holmes. Yes, yes. Thank you, my friend, good home. The most terrible thing has happened. I, I can scarcely believe it. Sit down, my dear fellow. Sit down, sit down. Yeah, that's better. Now, perhaps you can tell us what's happened. Slowly, take your time. My family, my sister, and my two brothers. It's too terrible. Why, just last night, I was visiting at the house. The Danny Quarter, it's called. All well and happy. With great cars. And now, without warning, I can... Easy, 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 it's easy, easy. Perhaps it's, uh, if you can manage to give us a few of the facts. I left them there last night. My sister, and the... And my two brothers are only in Georgia. Now, what time is that? The clock in the church keeps over at Paul Hughes. Chime in ten o'clock as I close the door behind me. I had this little all in the card room, laughing in a good spirit. And this morning, being an early rider, I was out taking the walk before breakfast when Dr. Richard overtook me in his carriage. With the news that he'd been sent for on a most urgent call from Titanic Water, something terrible happened to my family. I jumped in beside him and he looked at the horse. And what did you find at Titanic Water? Oh, Mr. Holmes, it was terrible. It was <laughs> My two brothers and my sister, they had in the card room just as I had left them. But what a change, what a ghastly change. Yes, yes. Brenda made that stone bed in her chair. And my two brothers sat on each side of her, laughing and shouting and singing. The scent is sick and clean out of them, and all three of them. My, my dead sister and my two demented brothers became upon their faces an expression of ghastly horror, a convulsion of terror. Oh, I tell you. Yes, yes. Dr. Richard really the show to come into sight and fainted into a chair. Anyone else in the house besides your sister and brothers? Only Mrs. Porter, the old housekeeper. And he said there's nothing during the night. I presume it was she who found him this morning. Yes, she always goes through the house in the morning, airing it out before the family comes down. When she reached the card room, she found him. She found them. The shock was too much for her. She had a nervous collapse. They, they had to put her to bed. I don't wonder. Mm, most exceptional case. Most exceptional. That's what she thought. You could find no traces of strangers in or around the house. Nothing was stolen, nothing touched. The vicar believes you're the only one who can solve the case, Mr. Holmes. He insisted I come to you. I'd be only too glad to handle the matter, of course. But first, I must ask you a few questions. Anything, Mr. Holmes, anything. To begin with, Mr. Guinness, why do you live with the vicar separated from your family? Any coldness or misunderstanding? Well, as a matter of fact, we did have a slight argument a few years ago. About some property, of course. But that was all settled long ago. We were on the best of terms. Right. Now, Mr. Guinness, if I'd like to call anything, anything at all, that was out of the ordinary. There was one thing that occurred to me. Yes, yes. As we sat at the card table, my back was to the window. George was facing me. And suddenly, I saw him look hard over my shoulder, out of the window. I turned quickly, and just for a moment, I thought I caught a glimpse of something moving. Man or animal? I don't quite know. My brother said he, he had the same feeling. You investigated? No, Mr. Holmes, we did not. Oh, my mother. It seemed to me unimportant. Silly, in fact. You had no premonition of evil? No, Mr. Holmes. Would to heaven we had. It's uncanny, that's what it is. Something came into that room, and that something killed my sister and dashed the light of reason from my brother's mind. Something devilish it was. That should prove be the case. I fear I should be of very little assistance, Mr. Tregenis. Come, Watson, come. I think perhaps you'd best go down to Tredenic Water at once. <laughs> This is the house, Mr. Holmes. Ah, whose carriage is this coming down the drive with the blinds down? There's someone in it. My brother, my poor brother. This took Richard's carriage. He's taking him to her son. It's so horrible, my poor brother. Easy, Virginia. Keep a stiff upper lip, man. We've got to find out who's responsible for this atrocity. Yes, I... I suppose you're right. I, I'll do my best. Ah, uh, shout, fellow. Uh, which are the windows of the card room? Uh, this one here. Oh, my God. Look, Holmes, look out. You are the walking. Oh, there, there, there. How clumsy of me. Sorry, Sir Guinness. I'm afraid I've drenched your boots. No matter, Mr. Holmes. No matter. Shall we go in? Yes, yes. I've seen all I need out here. This way. Card room is over here. Do you notice anything, Watson? No, I can't say I do. This is the card room. As I see, the window is still open. I'll keep her left it that way, I suppose. Yes, she said it was locked on the inside when she came quite in. Quite so, quite so. Candles quite got it out. Yes, cards still on the table. They've not risen from their chairs, I take it. And you left about ten. Well, that's at the hour of death sometime before eleven. 
Hmm. Fire burned out. A fire. Fire. Had they always a fire in this small room on a spring evening? It was cold and damp last night, Mr. Holmes. The fire was shortly after my arrival. Mm-hmm. That seems to be about all. No disturbance of any kind. Strange. Oh, come along, Holmes. It's going to give me the jump. There's something about the atmosphere. The rope was still hovering in the air. I wonder. What are you going to do now, Mr. Holmes? I think I shall resume the course of tobacco poisoning which Watson so uh, justly condemned. Come, Watson, come. We shall return to our cottage. Did anything occur to me, Mr. Guinness? I shall communicate with you. Watson, it won't do. All the facts are negative. I say, you, you think Mr. Guinness' account of his actions last night was truthful? Oh, quite, Watson, quite. Remember the incident of the spilt watering can? And I did that to obtain an impression of his foot. I take it you succeeded. I did, but that printed the sample. I was able to trace his movements last night. The story is correct. He left the house about ten, went straight back to the vicarage and didn't return. Nor did anyone else enter or leave the house. And then, then it must have been the man or the animal that they thought they saw in the bushes. He must have returned and frightened them to death. There's no such man or animal, Watson. Last night was a dark night, and anyone who had the wish to frighten these people would have been compelled to put his face against the glass before he could be seen. Well? There's a three-foot flower border outside the card room window. And there are absolutely no footprints in there. Yes, yes. But what does that mean? It means that Dragena's sister and her two brothers were alone when death struck the sister down and drove the brothers insane. Yes, oh, Why, that is it. It's natural. I hope not, Watson. I hope not. Look, Holmes, here comes another thing at our heart. A stranger, this time. Big, savage looking fellow. And by word, look at that huge head with the deep the eyes and the grizzled beard. And that, my dear Watson, is no other than the famous Dr. Leon Sterndale. Sterndale? What's the lion hunter and the story? Exactly. He's doing in this neighborhood. I've heard he owns a little cottage about five miles down the coast. He comes to live there after the bay himself, but he isn't off on one of the expeditions. Never mind, Watson, never mind. I'll do the honors of town. Ah, come in, Dr. Sandell, come in. Mr. Holmes, I presume? Yes, quite. Right. Uh, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How, How do you do? Uh, Mr. Holmes, I've come to you about the Trigenis affair. Oh, yes, yes. The police are utterly at a loss, but you, uh, you have a keener brain. Pardon me, Dr. Sandell, but why are you so concerned in this affair? Well, uh, you see. As a matter of fact, during my many residences in this locality, I've come to know the family of Trigenis very well. Their horrible fate has been a great shock to me, Mr. Holmes. Oh, so sorry. As a matter of fact, I was on my way to Africa. I'd gotten as far as Plymouth when the news reached me this morning. I came straight back to help the inquiry. But that makes you lose your ship. One sail for Africa this afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. I can take the next. Mm. Uh, when did you last see the Trigenis family, Dr. Sternell? I saw Brenda. Miss Trigenis. Three days ago. Just as I was leaving for Plymouth. Oh, they've been in Plymouth the last three days. Uh, yes. Oh, how did you get the news so quickly? Surely the Plymouth paper didn't carry an account of the matter in this morning's edition. I received a telegram. Telegram? Might I ask from whom? You're very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. That is my business, Dr. Stendhal. Telegram. The telegram was sent by the vicar, Mr. Roundtree. Right, I see. Now, uh, Mr. Holmes, have you reached any conclusion? Conclusion? Well, that would be a trifle premature. But I have every hope of bringing this matter to a satisfactory termination. Satisfactory to me, that is. Would you mind telling me of your suspicions point in any particular direction? Well, I don't feel this is the moment to answer that question, Dr. Sandell. And I see that I've been wasting my time. I need not prolong this visit. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Oh, smell. Hello, that Dr. Sandell, eh, Holmes? He told us more than he realized, Watson. But he knows even more. How could he? See, if he was in Plymouth. But was he, Watson? Was he? That statement is something for us to look into. Stay home. Must you go on smoking that foul pipe? Why not? Oh, yes, Mr. I think I can hardly see across the room as it is. Oh, all right. I feel depressed. Who knows what evil thing is talking abroad in our neighborhood? 
Now, light the lamp, Watson. It's the gathering twilight that makes you blue big. Oh, rubbish. Look here, Holmes. Uh, uh, what about that uh, Dr. Sterndale? Do you think he did it? No, Watson. I've been in communication with the Plymouth Hotel. The story's correct. He had been there for the past three days. He did receive a telegram from the vicar this morning. Uh, he couldn't possibly have anything to do with the Guinness tragedy last night. Oh, now what? Open the door, Watson. Open the door. Oh, my dear Vicar, come in, come in, come in. Dear me, dear me, you look as though you've seen a ghost. It's it tracked him down, the curse of the family. He's dead, dead with that same look of terror on his face. Who's dead? Mortimer Tregenis, in my study at the vicarage. My servant found him there, sitting beside his table. His face turned towards the window, and distorted with that same convulsion of fear that marked the features of his sister. Mm. Oh, my poor parish! Satan himself is loose among us, where devil ridden is home, devil ridden! <laughs> Depressing atmosphere. It was worse. I had the servant open the window. He's quite ill from the shop for Oh, what a terrible look on Tregenny's face. Huh? The whole body is contorted and convulsed in a very paroxysm of fear. You've never seen death in this form before, Watson? Never. You know of no poison that would have this effect? Good heavens, no. You... Hmm. Lamp is lit. It's been burning over an hour. Notice the oil consumed. And yet, doctors only just set in. Did anyone call at the vicarage this afternoon? Uh, no, I was out myself, but my servant says he let no one in. Well, then uh, Tregenis was alone. I then. wonder. The window was shut the time of death, but the lamp was lit. Curious. The window. Let me see, let me see the window, the window. Yes, yes, by Jove, I think I found something. What's that you're seeing in your pocket, Holmes? The lamp, the lamp, of course, the lamp. Yeah, notice this powder, which is filled in the base of the lamp. Red brown powder. Give me an envelope, Watson. Give me an envelope. I must have suspected the powder. Why are you so excited about the powder, Holmes? Because it contains a solution of our mystery, Watson. It is a thought and a solution. I say, Holmes, you haven't touched your supper. <laughs> oh, what a foul night. The wind's rising again. Oh, this place is getting on my nerves. Oh, be quiet, Watson, be quiet, be quiet. I don't want to be quiet. I want to talk. I'm tired of sitting here listening to that wind and roar of the surf down below. So well, why did you send for Dr. Stone? Because he is an authority on obscure African poison. Poison? Why are you interested in poison? Watson, there are two striking points in common in both cases under observation. Yes? In both cases, the atmosphere of the room had a curious effect on the persons of first entity. The housekeeper and the vicar's servant both were overcome, as was the doctor who was called in. That's right. I haven't thought of that. The room was still stuffy when he entered. Right. In each case, there was combustion going on in the room. The fire in the first place, the lamp in the second. And the lamp was not necessary. It was still daylight when it was lit. Yes, but don't you see? Something was burned in each case, which produced an atmosphere causing strange, toxic effects. An unknown poison. Good okay. heavens. I believe we have a sample of that poison in the brown powder spilled on the base of the lamp. But how are you going to prove it? I'm going to burn some of that powder. And notice its effect. Just a small pinch of the powder. Uh, perhaps you'd better leave the room, Watson. Leave well, you alone in here? Certainly not. I, I warn you, it, it's risky. Oh, something. Well, come on, let's get on with it. Very well. Take your chair opposite mine. Then we can watch each other for development. Right. Come along, come along, I'm ready. Good. And I put a pinch of the powder into our lamp. No. Musky. Couple. Noxious. Oh, listen to the wind. Home. Home. I. I'm afraid. I don't know why. But wind. I. I. I can feel my hair rising. Home, you see? That cloud down. Whirling, black and sinister. Oh, it's monstrous. It's concealing something. Something to put it to a magic. Oh, it's coming nearer. A little nearer. How do you smell it? Suffering, bring it to me. Hear that? Oh, it's... Oh, it's... It's hoofy. Hoofy. I know what it is. I can see it. 
And remember, household finance believes that a loan in itself is not sufficient. Their plan goes further. Once a household finance loan has helped you make a fresh start, household doctor of family finances will help you keep even with the help of his money management plan of ordered spending. Ordered spending is not another old-time cut-and-dried budget system, but a practical method of stopping those tiny leaks in the family pocketbook that are daily robbing you of many of the rewards of life. Act Monday. Don't delay. Arrange for a household loan and help yourself to a fresh start. There are 193 locally managed household finance offices in 134 cities, and you'll find an office conveniently located in your city. Welcome back. Um, this this was a, a, a pr- this was a pretty uh, interesting episode for quite a few reasons. First of all, uh, unlike uh, we had a new sponsor here, and I don't uh, I don't even know if this company is still in existence, but I have to say. Um, that there is no official implied endorsement here that was just shown for historical purposes. I did find it refreshing that uh, they didn't decide to have Dr. Watson come on and sell financial services. Uh, This episode has um, led to discussions of the, uh, in other media, uh, some of the movies and TV shows, um, of the time that have centered around this has actually led to discussions um, of Holmes's uh, of, of Holmes's uh, drug use, uh, which is something that um, that back during the, the era that the Holmes stories were written, it wasn't recognized as a problem. Uh, but others saw this as a you know when you read it as a modern day reader, you you understand that. What he was doing, it was kind of, you know, now, of course, it'd be illegal, but back then it was uh, unhealthy. It was something that Dr. Watson worried about. Uh, eventually got him to the point where he was uh, basically in the AA state of uh, recovered uh, of uh, recovered addict uh, who was basically viewed as about ready to, to go back into uh, the habit. Jeremy Brett, um, who, uh, portray- who portrayed Holmes on uh, Gren- uh, Granada uh, television used this episode and the hallucinations that came um, as a result of Holmes's experiment uh, to prove how the murder had occurred. Uh, he actually went ahead and he used that uh, as an occasion for Holmes to go ahead and give up uh, cocaine which was an interesting device. It had been something that had actually been bothering Brett, and he, got, he actually went to the trouble of getting permission from uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's estate to, to give it up. Um, one thing on Hector's performance here, uh, you know, it seems like in this role, Hector has got a kind of quality about his voice, a kind of uh, W.C. Fields uh, quality. Uh, almost as he's doing this, I I keep hearing I keep hearing Holmes's voice, and that, to be honest, this sounds to me like if W. C. Fields was trying to be serious, what it would what it would sound like as he tried to do Sherlock Holmes, and it may, I think it's even more pronounced in some other episodes. So, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host Adam Graham bringing you another exciting episode of Yours Truly. Johnny Dollar. Well, I have got to uh, uh, admit, I think I found a new favorite online radio station. It is www.audionoir.com. They actually play detective uh, radio programs right on your computer uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, You can stream them. 
Uh, and they basically just run a rotation of about 2,000 shows. Um, so uh, it varies as to what you'll get. But if you want a little bit more, um, audionoir.com, very, inter- very interesting station. And you can even hear it a few places just uh, if you're in the right place in Chicago. All right, well, we've been neglecting getting to our blog comments the last couple of weeks, and I'm sorry, we've got some actual really nice comments. Um, I just kept forgetting to uh, copy them down, so I made sure we made note of this. Got a comment from Dave. Love the Sherlock Holmes. This was from the Noble Black Bachelor. This actor sounds just like Jeremy Brett, the actor who did so well with his role on PBS, and he had BBC in... Uh, uh, in uh, parentheses in the 80s i thought it was i thought it was him at first the sound quality was so good keep him coming well thanks i actually got nervous because that that one i made the mistake as to um who was actually uh who, who uh whether this was an actual home story so i double checked and jeremy brett didn't do any um radio version of Holmes, uh and brett's uh, Brett's uh, Holmes was on ITV, I found out, which is like the competitor to the BBC in Britain. So, uh, But I was wrong about who was the star, and I'll get into that maybe in the second half um, after, after we uh, play the episode. Uh, uh, Jen writes that she loves the show, but I kind of flinched when you attempted pr- to pronounce the great Agatha Christie's detective name. I might suggest the phonetic pronunciation. Here goes. Hercule Poirot. Hercule Poirot. I think the Poirot sounds most believable. So if I can just call him Poirot, uh, I think I'll get by. We don't have that many episodes of uh, of Poirot's real old-time radio show around, so I think I'll manage that way. Um, if I really was that was close enough, Laura writes, Adam, I've been listening uh, for a few years now, and I enjoy your shows, although I do admit to skipping, skipping through some of your speaking just to hear the show. Other times, I love hearing the comments you make. Uh, this is regarding an article I posted on old-time radio distribution um, uh, models, by the way. She writes, you are right that the medium you pick for listening is up to each individual pr- individual's preference. That being said, thank you for taking the time to post the shows. We are an iPod family, and I can tell you my husband's iPod has nothing but radio shows on them. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, glad to be able to provide that listening pleasure. Speaking of iPods and iPhones, um, we're in the process of getting an app an iPhone app, and also for uh, works with the iPod Touch for the great detectives of old time radio. And I'd love to get your feedback on what were some worthwhile extras we could add. We can put audio, we can put video, or we can put PDFs into uh, the app. And then um, Wizard Media, which uh, uh, basically sells it, and we get a li- we get a cut. It, it'll probably be a dollar ninety nine. Um, so let let me know what you, what some things you might find um, just general if you've got an iPhone or iPod Touch. Let me know what you might find worthwhile. Um, what I'm thinking of doing, um, and I really want feedback on this first one, is on the Sherlock Holmes episodes. In, it, when they're based on a specific story, um, basically including that story in a PDF uh, format uh, that you can uh, read and uh, scroll through on your iPod. Let me know if that's something you'd be interested in, um, or if you're just like, I don't want to uh, read Sherlock Holmes on my iPod. Uh, let me know. And also, there are a lot of... Um, detective movies and television shows that have come into the public domain. And basically, we would go ahead and add that as an extra. So let me know what type of extras uh, might be worthwhile to you as an iPhone or iPod uh, owner 
and much appreciated. And again, thanks for your comment, Laura. By the way, we, I, I don't just, uh, greatdetectives.net, it's not just show notes over there. We do actually go ahead and we post articles. Um, we've done some on Father Brown. I did a review of a mystery book that was actually a Father Brown Sherlock Holmes crossover. I posted an article about Pat Novak, and I did that one about old time radio distribution. Uh, and generally, I do those. Um, I do those every uh, weekend. Um, and we also do link to some old time radio news. So there's some stuff to check out over at GreatDetectives.net. Well, we're going to get into the show in a second. We got some more comments to get to after the uh, after uh, the episode. Um, before we get started, I, I want to encourage you uh, to let you know that uh, when it comes to flying, a lot of us like to fly to travel in style, just like Johnny Dollar. But unlike Johnny Dollar, we don't have the action-packed expense account, and so we've got to uh, keep our budget in mind. Well, with Johnny Dollar Air, you can in, uh, you can uh, uh, you can travel in style. Uh, at a reasonable price by being able to name your own price uh, on airline tickets, hotels, as well as being able to get a lot of uh, published specials without any type of uncertainty. Uh, so when you're traveling, just remember this name, johnnydollarair.com. That's right, johnnydollarair.com. We actually got a domain name for it. When my wife heard me read that she, uh, last week as a subdomain, she thought it was really great and encouraged me to get the .com. And since I've, uh, since I've got one and one, I was actually able just to get that for six ninety nine for the first year. Wait a second, one and one. We got that. That's a twofer. Hosting.greatdetectives.net for the 699.com uh, domain uh, is going on currently. We'll end, but then there'll, there'll be other specials. All right. Well, without any further ado, let's get into today's episode. Uh, this one is called "Murder Is a Merry-Go-Round." The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Nutmeg State Casualty and Bonding Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of series of accidents affecting your policyholder, the Funfair and Weatherly Carnival shows, or how I went for a spin on a case we might refer to as murder is a merry-go-round. <laughs> Expense account item one, 25 cents. Purchase of Billboard, theatrical magazine, to check the route of Funfair and Weatherly Carnival shows. Expense account item two... $68. Air and train fares to Talladega, Alabama. Item three, $1.10. Cab fare and what was only a fair imitation of a cab from Talladega Depot to the dusty vacant lot which had overnight found itself wearing theatrical makeup. Brightly as the hot sun beat down on the midway, it couldn't help the layout of canvas and flats from looking beat up. A perspiring mechanic shot sparks of profanity back at an obstinate motor as he tried to get it to roll the giant hoop of a Ferris wheel. I asked him what he knew about the accident of a week before when a car dropped off the same Ferris wheel, badly injuring three. He was charming. Listen, pretty boy. Don't go getting nosy around here. The Joe in charge of the electric scooter concession was just as sweet. On the subject of how come one of his scooters blew up a few nights back, sending a citizen to the hospital... He just didn't feel like talking. If you ain't a cop, start moving. If you are, where's your warrant? I was just asking the pilot of the giant airplane spin who he thought might have cut the cables the night one of his wallboard gliders took off across the carnival crowd, crashing and busting up a few more customers, when I got a canvasman's version of a sharp answer. A tenth state right behind my ear. Oh. Well, so 
Sleeping beauties waking up, huh? Who are you? I thought maybe you'd be sick of asking questions. First, maybe you better answer a few. Uh-uh. Before you get up. Number one, who are you? A pilgrim from Hartford. Never mind the double talk, wise guy. What's your name? My name is Johnny Dollar. But right now, I feel like two cents. What's your big interest in those accidents you were asking questions about? Strictly academic. I'm only representing the insurance company that's paying off on those accidents. Now maybe you'll tell me who you are and where I am. Ah, thought you guys were smarter. Dollar, I'll let you in on a little secret. Next time you want to find something out on a traveling show, get to the board first. Asking a lot of questions around a circus or carnival lot is unhealthy. Where is the boss, Miss Pepper? Uh, Louise is in the other end of this trailer. She'll be right out. Ah, okay, you can get up on your feet. Oh, thanks. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I don't stay up on him. I feel more like sitting down. Uh, go ahead. You still haven't told me who you are. My name's Brennan. Oh, yeah, Shanty Brennan. Yeah, you're the general manager of the show. They told me all about you. Louisa Pepper's right arm and strong arm. How long will she be? Yeah, she's getting dressed. Just finished taking a nap. We drove all night to get here. How about having a blast with me while you're waiting? No, thanks. I haven't enjoyed a noon bottle since I was two. But don't let me stop you. Thanks. Oh. You're sure you won't have one? I'm sure. Brown, the insurance company's checking up on your show. The police chiefs in the last ten towns you've played say it's a clean one. Uh, we haven't got a pickpocket or a grifter on the lot. But plenty of trouble, huh, during those past ten stops? At least once a night somebody's got hurt. But never any of us. It's always one or two of the townies, the citizens. Last night a car on the whip cut loose. That sent four to the hospital. Uh-huh. Four more insurance claims for nutmeg state casualty and bonding, huh? Yeah. In one more town, we won't be able to play again for a couple of years. No wonder we didn't travel out of that town last night by rail, tarred and feathered. But ten straight nights now, you've had at least one big accident every night. What's your guess, Brennan? Has fate taken a steady job on your show, or is somebody out to get you? Somebody's out to get it. Okay, well, do you have any idea? Oh. Oh. Why didn't you tell me we were entertaining a gentleman, Sandy? Had to put on some more clothes. It would have taken a lot more clothes to cover all there was of Louisa Pepper. She looked like an aging Cupid doll, but even in a carnival, she was no prize. I didn't like the look in her eye. It looked much too friendly. So right away, I decided to change the unspoken subject. Uh, Miss Pepper, I'm here on business insurance. Sorry, we're not buying any. And I'm not selling any. The way things have been going, the insurance company I represent would probably like to buy some of yours back. Oh? Yeah. I'm going to not make state casualty. Investigating the accident. <laughs> Hope you find out more than we've been able to, and fast, before we go broke. The word's traveling one town ahead of us. They got us taken for the dangerous midway. Have you been using police protection? <laughs> Twenty extra cops a night at ten dollars a cop. So, night before last, a guy winds up with a hammer to try and ring the bell and win a cigar. The top of the hammer flies off and almost brains a cop. <laughs> Around this show, the police need protection. I see what you mean. How are you fixed for people who don't like you? We got money to choose from? Dollar, we treat our help fair and square. We know them all and trust them all. Fire anybody lately? Nobody. The only ones who left were floaters. But none of them had a beef. Okay, Miss Pepper. Now think back. In all your life, who do you know who'd most like to see you have a real bad time? Only one guy. And he's not around. Dead? As good as. He's in jail. Has been for the last eight and a half years. That's a long time. How long did you go up for? Ten years. Uh, what are you thinking, Dollar? I'm thinking that with time off for good behavior, maybe he's not in jail. Not in jail? Sandy, he's got to be in jail. He's got to be, I tell you. You told me you were... All right, right, break it up, Louisa. If Carter Lacey had a voice as sharp as yours, he could saw his way out of jail. Okay, Dollar, you made a guess. How about seeing how good it is? Sure. I'll find out if your bogeyman is still in jail, uh, but I didn't catch that name. Lacey. Carter Lacey. And where has he been in the pokey? Massachusetts State Prison. At Charleston. Well, what did he go up for? What's that to you? Cut it, Louisa. Dollar, we sent Carter Lacey to jail for attempted murder. He tried to kill Louisa's niece, Myrtle. Is she around? 
running the snake show on the midway. Stella, how soon can you check whether Carter got out? As soon as I can make a telephone call. But, Shanny, before I do, I'd like to elaborate on that guess I made. Now I'd not only guess that Carter Lacey is out of jail, but I'd also guess that he's been out a little over ten days. Expense account, item four, three dollars. Telephone call to Massachusetts State Prison, confirming both of my guesses. Carter Lacey had checked out of the Bay State Hotel Greystone for bad boys two weeks previously. Item five, thirty-two dollars. Telephone calls to various hotels in the last ten pounds the fun fair and weatherly carnival shows have played. Item six, ten cents. Two nickels spent calling two hotels right here in Talladega. Then I dropped one more nickel in the telephone. Got the lucky number? Yes, sir. We do have a Mr. Carter Lacey visitor. Room 312. Shall I stop? And hit the jackpot. Friends account item seven. 65 cents. Cab fare to Sunshine Hotel. Tip the driver? One dollar. From the lobby, I call room 312. He invited me up. I invited him down. I knew I'd feel better talking to Carter Lacey with a lot of people around. They'd make nice witnesses if he suddenly got homesick for prison life and uh, used me as his ticket back. I waited in the coffee shop. The waitress brought me a cup of coffee, and uh, my palate went to work refereeing a one-sided bout between the strong java and the weak cream. Hello. Dollar? All right. Sit down. Thanks. So you're caught a lacy, huh? Have some coffee? No, thanks. It keeps me awake night. How about your conscience? Having the same trouble with that? My conscience deserves an eight-and-a-half-year rest. But it can't start its vacation until I even up a few scores. Busting up carnivals. <laughs> Child's play. Look, Dollar, over the phone, you told me you're an insurance investigator. You can save your company a lot of money. How? Oh. Call them up and tell them not to insure the lives of three people. Because any minute now, two of them are going to be dead. Uh, Louisa Pepper, Anise Myrtle, and uh, Shanty Brennan. Yeah, Dollar. I'm going to kill two of those people. The other one's still my friend is going to help me do it. In case you don't know your law, Dollar, don't bother calling the cops. I can't be held for making a threat unless I put it in writing. Oh, Lacey, I don't know what your beef is against the people running that carnival, but those accidents have been hurting a lot of innocent bystanders. Dollar, you're talking to a guy who really knows what it means. Getting hurt as an innocent bystander. <laughs> Expense account, item eight, $25. Retainer to local detective agency hiring shadow for Mr. Carter Lacey. Explanation? An ounce of crime prevention is worth a ton of trials. Item nine, twenty. Cab fare back for the evening's festivities at the Fun Fair and Weatherly Carnival, which was rapidly becoming more and more of a thrill show. Expense account, item ten, 30 cents. Down payment on ulcer, eating supper at what the carny people call a grease joint. I made my way among the trailers that were lined up behind the midway, and as I looked for the one housing Louisa Pepper's snake-charming niece Myrtle, the burning sensation around my heart wasn't all caused by the hot dogs I'd just eaten. Who is it? I've got a message from Carter Lacey. What did he say? I said I've got a message from Carter Lacey. For you and uh, your Aunt Louisa, Shanty Brennan. You're the only one I haven't met yet, so I thought I'd deliver it to you first. Where is he? In town. Got any snakes in the trailer? No, of course not. All right, then. How about inviting me in? Are you the insurance guy they told me about? Yeah, that's right. Okay, come in. What did Lacey say? He said that he's going to kill two of the three of you. Which two? Didn't he say? No, he didn't. He just said that two of you are going to get it. And that his one friend among you, the remaining one, is going to help him do it. Oh, God. He hates you. I know he'll kill us. You say Louisa and Sandy don't know yet? No, they don't. You're the first to know. Well, then wait here. I'll run and tell him. I'll stop back here before I go into the tent to do my next show. Grab yourself a drink. I'll be right back. But she wasn't right back, and it's just as well she wasn't. She might have interrupted me while taking a sightseeing trip to the drawers of the trailer's built-in bureau. The piles of silky nothings that give gals that certain something didn't tell me anything I hadn't known about women before. 
But a little black book stashed among them did. I needn't have rushed my search, though, because Myrtle Pepper was still gone after ten minutes. That's about the time I headed back to her Aunt Louise's trailer, pulled open the door, and walked in. You scared me, Della, barging in like that. Mr. Dollar, I told you I'd be right back. Did Myrtle here deliver Mr. Lacey's little love letters? Yes, the fool. He always was a fool. He can't kill us. And it's against the law? I mean, I mean... I mean, it's impossible, that's all. Look, Miss Pepper, you and your niece here are both plenty scared. Why, oh, you're out shaking those two stances you got working over on the midway. Myrtle, have you told Shanny about Lacey's threat? Yeah, I, I met him on the way over here. Asked him if he'd feed my snakes before showtime. They're dangerous to work with if they're hungry. Yeah, I told him. He said he'd join us here. Well, what did he say when you told him? He said if Lacey had one of us helping him... And the three of us had better stick together so we could at least watch each other. Smart man. He had a good idea. I see the three of you had better stick close to each other. Beginning right now. Come on. Where are we going? Over to the snake tent. And when we get there, Myrtle, you'll be the only one of us who'll be among friends. The three of us left Louise's trailer. We walked past the back of the shooting gallery concession right in the front of it. And along the back of the line of canvas shanties. We stopped at one. Myrtle pulled back the canvas flap. And I stepped in ready for anything. With the ladies not far behind me, I edged slowly over to the square red board fence set up in the center of the tent. There were danger signs splashed in white paint along the outside walls of the pit. I clenched my teeth and looked down to the wire mesh top at a slithering tangle of writhing, angry reptiles. And there, lying among them with a vicious red welt splashing his forehead, was Shanty Brennan. He was feeding his snakes, all right. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, here is some news. 30 minutes of new thrills will be added to CBS 10 Great Sunday Night Entertainment this coming Sunday. At 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where you formerly heard Spike Jones, CBS will bring you screen star John Lund in an adventure-packed tale of a ship filled with terror and horror. This story, A Shipment of Mute Fate, starring John Lund, is the first of three special broadcasts from CBS' famous Escape series. It will be heard over most of these stations immediately preceding a familiar show which brings you a different kind of escape, the Jack Benny Show. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. murder mystery where the actors had been hissing instead of the audience. The lead character in that snake fit wasn't going to win any Academy Award. The scene of the crime was no place for a man, let alone a woman, so I heard it Annie Louisa and her niece Myrtle out of the tent and back into the trailer. Oh, poor daddy. Oh, horrible. You say this wrong, Dollar, when I said Carter Lacey couldn't do it. Oh, it's going to happen to us. According to what uh, Lacey told me, Myrtle, what's supposed to happen is only going to happen to one of you. What do you mean? Well, he claims that one of you is in this with him. And that one knows she's safe. This may turn out to be an acting contest between you two. What's that crack supposed to mean? Well, the one who's safe wouldn't want anybody to know she feels safe, huh? Oh. <laughs> I wish I had learned to cry. Who is it? You don't think it's me? Well, I know it ain't me. Oh, ladies, ladies, how about observing a moment of silence in memory of the deceased? Well, I give you a few instructions. Okay. Have you got a gun in here, Louisa? Yes. And a license to carry it. Good. Where is it? The gun, not the license. I won't give it to you. Well, if you don't, people might get to thinking that you're Carter Lacey's girlfriend and accomplice. Anyway, I don't want the gun to take with me. I want to leave it here. Where is it? In that drawer right over there. Which end of the drawer? What's the matter with you, blind? You'll see it. Uh, I'm not turning my bag on you. Which end? You'd make a lousy trapeze out of Stella. You don't take any chances. This end, toward me. Thanks. Well, now where are the keys to the car hitched to the front of this land yacht? What are they for, Dollar? Just another chance I'm not taking. With those keys in my pocket, this trailer won't be joyriding anybody off into the night. Where are they? I'll get them for you. Wait a minute, Michael. How come you know where Louisa's keys were? Well, 
Ah, Myrtle. How come? Well, well, they're laying right there in plain sight. Oh. Thanks. Well, I'm going out and call the police. Louisa, I want you to get into that chair down at the other end of the trailer. Okay, General. You've got the gun. And you, Myrtle, get on that bunk down at the other end. I don't understand all this. And now, ladies, while I'm gone, I don't want one of you gals to be knocking off the other. But on the other hand, I can't leave you here without protection. So I'm leaving the gun right here on this table in the middle of the trailer. And if uh, Carter Lacey comes knocking at your door, you can have yourselves a race for the gun. Expense account item 11, five cents. Telephone call to the local police. Plus another nickel spent calling a taxi. The cops arrived in four minutes, the cab in 15. Its driver had no siren to take him to the traffic light. Item 12, a dollar ten. Cab fare on an exceedingly slow and torturous trip to the Sunshine Hotel. A tip to his kind of a driver, a nickel. I went up to the third floor and headed down the hall to Carter Lacey's room, 312. I rapped for an entrance, but all that came back was an echo. The lock on the door was the soft touch type known to the trade as the burglar's friend. So I went in. Cars still in Alabama? Oh. Stiff still in Alabama tonight. Oh, operator. Operator, this is an emergency call. Let me have a telephone to police, will you? <sighs> Hello? Police department? This is the same guy who just called you from the carnival to report a murder. Yeah. Well, you can send in the second team. I've got another one for you over here at the Sunshine Hotel. Room 312. The party's just been strangled. Yes, I'm sure. Lots of bruises and deep-set fingernail marks on the throat. Sure I know who it is. The name of the deceased is Myrtle Pepper. Myrtle Pepper certainly has been a fast worker. She not only had beat me down to the hotel, she managed to get herself killed in the bargain. I dusted the room for information, which was obviously more than the floor made had done for dirt and came up with a kind of an eye-opener you don't drink. A pint-sized surprise in the form of some old newspaper clippings and Connor Lacey's prison release form. And what let him out let me in on something. I got out of the room into the elevator, and when I hit the lobby wondering where to start looking for him, I found him sitting there looking at me. Hi. Why do you want to talk, Lacey? I don't want to. But if you want to try and make me, what's the matter with right here? Okay. I supplied you with an alibi today. I don't see him in the lobby. That detective? He had stomach trouble. He got kicked in it. You can reach him at the city hospital. You know, in prison, I was a trustee. I get out. Nobody trusts me. Oh, with that forecast you gave me this morning, what else? Forecast? Yeah. You predicted that you'll kill two people. Well, tonight the two people are dead. Shanty out at the carnival, and now Myrtle up in your room. What does that make you? A good forecaster. Or a killer, maybe? <laughs> Thanks for the maybe. Look, Dollar, I came to this town to take care of something. I took care of it. You want to yell, cop? Go ahead. From now on, nothing bothers me. Well, then stop chewing your nails. You told me this morning that one of those three people was working with you. There's only one left. And suddenly, Lacey, I don't believe your story. Suddenly, I don't care. Danny Brennan lied to me this morning. He said that you went to prison on a charge of attempted murder. Your prison release papers say you went up for grand larceny. You see what happens to bad little boys who tell lies? I'm not through yet. I fished a bank book out of Myrtle Pepper's trailer, a three-way joint account. Myrtle, Shanty, and Louisa. The first deposit, $60,000. The date, the same year you were thrown into the can for stealing $60,000. To me, that spells a three-way split for them and a frame for you. Also to you, it spells a motive for hating all three of them. So I lied to you. What are you going to do, wash my mouth out with soap? From now on, I don't need any answers from you, including smart ones. But look, you'd better stick around. If the cops don't pick you up for murder, maybe the hotel will want to press charges against you for having an extra unregistered person occupying your room. Oh, 
Where is it? Johnny Dollar. Oh, wait a minute. Where's Carter? They arrested him? Tell me, did he escape? He's at the hotel, and the cops are on their way down there right now. I hope he's more talkative with them than he was with me. You talked to him? Yeah, I had a long, one-sided conversation with him. There's one thing I still can't quite figure out. Whether he really intended to kill Shanty and Myrtle or not. Myrtle? Yeah, strangled. Myrtle? Poor little angel. Of course he meant to kill him. He hated him. He hated us all. Well, you can hardly blame a fellow for being annoyed. Framed in a grand larceny trap by three old chums. But you've got the wrong idea, Louisa. What I meant was, did he ever really intend to kill them himself? Or did he just intend to set off the greatest chain reaction since the atom bomb? And just sit back and watch the three of you try to beat each other to it? Well, that's crazy talk. Yeah, like a fox, maybe. He made his threat to me, knowing I'd carry it back to you. I say you, because you're the only one left. You see, he set himself up as a patsy. He'd been framed by you once before. To me, it looks like Carter Lacey learned a few things about wrong people during that eight-year stretch. Namely, that they never trust each other. You're absolutely nuts, Dollar. I think you'd better get out of here. Go peddle your insurance. The cops will take care of Mr. Lacey. I don't think they will, Louisa. Why not? Myrtle was strangled. That's the kind of murder a man would commit. Well... But there was a set of deep fingernail marks on her throat. And Carter Lacey bites his nails. So maybe you'd better get yourself a manicure before the police arrive. Thanks for the advice. Stand right there, Dollar. This time I got the gun. Hold everything, Louisa. Carter! It's the standoff, Louisa. Point that thing someplace else before I point mine up your snoot. Okay, Dollar, get out. What's the matter with you, Lacey? Are you cracking up? Your plan was going along fine. First, Myrtle tossed Shanny to a snake. Then Louisa took care of Myrtle. There's only one left, and the state will take care of her for you. That's not enough. There's one satisfaction I haven't enjoyed so far. That's hearing one of these pigs squeal. Cutter, we can stick with the money in the show and, and get out of here? The only one that's going to get out of here is Dollar. Beat it. I beat it, all right. I was the only one in the trailer without a gun. I plunged into the darkness looking for something and came up with a tent rope. Dashed back to the trailer door and lashed the knob to the guide rail. I didn't want those gun-happy birds flying the coop. Just then, the season opened. I didn't know who was going to come out the worst in there, the hunter or the hunted. The only key I had to the situation was the key to the car, the one I'd picked up earlier in the day. The car turned the trailer to the carnival bank lot and out to the highway. When I hit the cement, I started spinning the rubber. As we hit the streets of the sleeping city, things woke up. Whoever was left back there snapped a shot at me through the trailer's front window. The second shot was my cue to try to ruin their aim by playing rock by trailer, swinging the car from one side of the street to the other. Just as a not-so-sharp shooter made another try, I picked up just what I was looking for. A game of tag with a police patrol car. Expense account, item 13, 15 cents, by carbonate of soda. Those midway hot dogs I'd had for supper were no thoroughbreds. Item 14, $35, cigars for night shift. Talladega police, for whom I had started things smoking. Item 15, $3, hotel bill. But uh, never let it be said that I ever turned in a measly $3 hotel bill for myself. This was to check out of the Sunshine Hotel, a man who had checked out in the trailer at the hands of Louisa Pepper. Louisa Pepper, the only one who was a good bet to catch up with Brennan, who had been murdered by Myrtle. And Myrtle, who had been loused up by Louisa. And Carter, whom she had also carted out of this world, proving that when you start any kind of chain reaction, you should be careful, because you're never going to be sure where it's going to stop. Express account total... What? Only $692.18. Ah, I must be slipping. Uh, Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
The Madman of Music is moving. Yes, Spike Jones, formerly heard on CBS on Sunday, is already unpacking his famous collection of flit guns, dish fans, and other instruments, ready for tomorrow night's premiere broadcast as a CBS Saturday star. Hear the Spike Jones show on most of these same stations tomorrow night at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time when it joins Bon Monroe, Gene Autry, Gangbusters, and Sing It Again as a regular Saturday night CBS feature. Listen in again next week when CBS brings you yours truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell as Johnny. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd with music by Mark Warno. And is produced and directed by Richard Sandville. Welcome back. Well, this was just an absolutely solid, uh, hard-boiled uh, sto- uh, story. Fabulous work by the writers. I really enjoyed this. This one has been the best uh, episode uh, by Charles Russell so far. So I just absolutely uh, in, uh, enjoyed this. I thought there was a great uh, mystery, great action. It, this is just uh, almost, you know, this is one of those shows you just go, wow, uh, uh, fantastic. Um, there were a couple things I did notice. First of all was Johnny Dollar's ability to calculate in his head uh, the equation for time off with good behavior. Uh, to, to within a few days, that's... That's an impressive talent, and you just wonder where he got it from. Um, And then one of the commercials was interesting because it advertised for an episode of Escape featuring John Lunn. John Lunn, of course, um, in the uh, towards the uh, uh, early to middle fifties, would take over the role of Johnny Dollar as the third on-year Johnny Dollar, and using that equation uh, that. Uh, was used early, uh, that I mentioned, I think, last show, where basically with inflation, the total cost that we hear on the air is about 7.3 times what it'd be in today's dollars. In today's dollars, uh, Johnny Dollar's expense account would have been $5,052.91. But he's slippy. All right, we got some more comments. Um, This one is in regards to a comment I made last week about a about an MP3 a player that looked like uh, a vintage um, uh, uh, like a vintage radio. Daniel uh, writes, "Hi Adam, listening to the current podcast, you mentioned retro styled radios. I wanted to let you know that in fact there are a few mo- models of retro styled or cathedral style radios that are set up for MP3 players to be connected to them. I believe a couple Crosley models are set set up for this. And if you don't mind a little bit of anachronism, there's also the Explorer XM radio." And that's at GameRoomAntiques.com, and you just uh, you look you search for Explorer. Explorer has a great retro look that's flawed only by a backlit LCD display. Yeah, that might mess up the illusion a little bit. Uh, regarding the shows in general, love it. I subscribe to a ton of old time radio podcasts, but your Dragnet show and Great Detectives are tops. I especially enjoy the non Dragnet Jack web shows and invite my friends to listen with me quite often. They're always surprised at how different Webb sounds when he's not playing Joe Friday. Keep up the great work and the excellent variety of shows on Great Detectives. Well, thanks a lot, Daniel. Yeah, and I, I think it reminds us that Jack Webb was an actor. Uh, who played roles. He was more than just Joe Friday. I know um, my wife was, was shocked on one show. Uh, I, I said, yeah, on this one, Jack Webb, Jack Webb plays the killer. Jack Webb plays a bad guy? Yeah, was, he was an actor, and they needed somebody to play that part, or they couldn't tell the story. Um, 
Jen uh, writes in, Dear Adam, I have, uh, and this is regarding the Noble Bachelor, which I mentioned, of course, there's the, there was that whole error with thinking it wasn't an original uh, story by Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, Jen writes, Dear Adam, I have the same copy of The Noble Bachelor, but my copy contains additional dialogue at the end, in which the actor playing Dr. Watson says, In real life, my name is Norman Shelley. My friend Carlton Hobbs played Sherlock Holmes. The same recording at the end of my copy, The House of Three Gables, I've listened to both recordings, Side by side on my iPod, and they are identical with your recordings, except for the fact your recording does not have the additional actor identification at the end. I think that this might clarify some of the discrepancy in voice recognition you have expressed. These recordings are from the BBC recording that was broadcast from Chicago and later sponsored by Berkeley Bank. I know that you will want this information, even though it means possible extra work for you. Well, Jen, I actually, after receiving that, I debated whether I should just go ahead and re-record the intro and outro for those, for that episode because it's like I I messed two things up on the Noble Bachelor. Um, this one though I don't really blame myself for. I blame the fact of uh, kind of our uh, categorization problem uh, with Sherlock Holmes. The sites I got these through identified these episodes as coming from. Uh, as coming from the 1930s and being tied to the Richard Gordon series. Unfortunately, they turned out not to be. It's really a challenge to kind of wade through these. So apologies for the mistake. Thanks for bringing it to um, to my attention. Um, and we'll, we'll go ahead. I already made the correction on the Noble Bachelor. Um, and... Um, and I, I will go ahead and make one on the House of Three Gables. Those episodes still are in the public domain. That's the good news. Uh, the episode um, uh, the ep- the episode aired uh, uh, Adventure of the Noble Bachelor. Uh, was actually aired by the BBC, uh, BBC on August eighteenth, nineteen fifty nine. So a little bit different than the nineteen thirty three I thought. Um, but these were somewhat obsc- uh, somewhat obscure actors in both uh, productions. So uh, apologies, but uh, that's the kind of the risk. On the bright side, you got a, a, a preview of what um, Shelley and Hobbes are going to sound like when we do actually get to listen to them. And they'll probably be actually the last Holmes and Watson duo we're going to get to hear on this. So, um, so yeah. It's just it's just a mess there with the Holmes uh, thing. Uh, got any comments? Feel free to email me box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, we will be back next week with another episode um, of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, and join us on Monday for uh, Box Thirteen. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>